Okay, we're settling in. Chris Nevitt, please take your seat. <laughs> okay, actually just get to a spot because I would ask you all to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. Here we go. It's all yours. Wait, wait, hold on, wait. Eva Henry? Here. Bill Holland? Here. Elise Jones? Here. Dennis Harward? Tim Mock? Tom Hayden? <laughs> Chrissy Panganello? Here. Chris Nevitt? Here. Roger Partridge? Here. Gail Watson? Connie McLean, Don Rozier, Here. Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Sue Horn, Here. David Spellman, Suzanne Jones, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. George Teal, Here. Kathy Noon, Here. Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Here. Gail Christie, Here. Jim Benson, Here. Debbie Nasta, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Randy Penn, Joe Jefferson, Dan Wooth, Mark Gruber, Joyce Thomas, uh, Daniel Dick, Here. Uh, George Heath, Samantha Mearing, <coughs> Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Henry Ergot, Lynette Kelsey, Paula Bovo, Doris Ragoni, Sarah Karis Graves, Here. Ron Wachowski, Jerry Presley, Here. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Tom Quinn, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Cernanek, present, Jackie Malay, Here. Gabe Santos, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. John O'Brien, Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Forey, Chris Larson, Joe Gearlock, <coughs> Joyce Downing, Here. John Dyack, Here. Gary Howard, Here. Rita Dozel, Val Vigil, JJ Dove, Here. Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, uh, Simon Tafoya, Deb Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter, Here. and we do have a quorum. <laughs> Okay, and we have a new member here this evening, Debbie Nasta from Dakota. Debbie, would you stand up and let us all say hello to you? Thank you so much for joining us here at Dr. Cog. And you picked a big meeting to come to, so, <laughs> so lucky you. Um, all right, with that, I would like to move to uh, agenda number four. I move to approve our agenda this evening. May I have a motion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Great. We have an agenda. Let's move right into it then. We've got our strategic informational briefings. We're going to have a presentation tonight by the Colorado Department of Transportation Executive Director Shailen Batt. Shailen, welcome and thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Let's give him a round of applause as a thank you for showing up. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Man, I was like, you give me a round of applause, I don't even get a good evening out of you. This is tough. Uh, so thank you very much for allowing me to come before you and address this group. And uh, I've done a lot of this since I've come to Colorado. My first three days uh, on the job, I did a 1,100-mile tour around the state, uh, went up to Greeley, uh, got in a traffic jam at 10.30 in the morning on I-25, well north of Denver. And I was like, is there an accident? Is there an incident? And they're like, no, this is just a congestion. I was like, oh, that's great. Uh, 
and then went down to Pueblo and then over to uh, Alamosa, Durango, Grand Junction, and then back and then Don, who was coming with me, Don and I, Don Hunt and I have known each other for four years. We kind of became, I was a secretary, he was an executive director at the same time. We're really close friends. We're so close that he wanted to arrange for me to enjoy uh, uh, traffic on I-70 coming back on a Saturday afternoon. Um, but two things happened on the drive. One, everybody talked about all the uh, avalanche danger when we were going over uh, 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 Wolf Creek Pass and uh, Red Mountain Pass, but there was no snow. Uh, and it was like 70 degrees. So I was like, how do you have a, you know, you, I thought you needed snow. I'm no, I am a flatlander, but I do know you need snow uh, for an avalanche. I had that part done. And then uh, we were coming back uh, on I-70 uh, on Saturday afternoon. We went 73 miles an hour the whole way. And I was like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I think I've solved this problem. <laughs> what else you got? Uh, so um, I wanted to come before you tonight, and I, I want to leave some time for Q&A because I know that a lot of you have questions. I don't know if I have answers, but I, I certainly have, uh, um, you know, I, I'll attempt some, uh, some answers. But I just want to give you a bit of my background because, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an MPO here. And my, uh, my first big job in transportation was running an MPO. Now, this is a big uh, MPO. Mine was a small MPO. It was for Bowling Green, Warren County. Uh, in, anybody been to Bowling Green, Warren County? In, in Kentucky? Well, thank you very much. It's the home of the Corvette. The Corvette has been produced there since the 1980s because the Corvette plant was moved from St. Louis because St. Louis became non-attainment and they had all these issues with uh, air pollution and we had lots of great air in, uh, in Kentucky, I guess. Uh, although there's a national park just north of there that uh, is non-attainment with no industrial sources in the area. So it's, uh, it's something that everybody struggles with. So I became an MPO director and then um, went up and fought for some, uh, uh, for some TE money for some sidewalks in a small town where uh, the town had placed a school on a state highway and there were no sidewalks. And so the, the mayor asked me to come out and watch these kids walk along this uh, uh, state highway with trucks rumbling by to get to the school because there was no sidewalks and he needed $200,000. Uh, and all the TE money was going to the old train uh, kind of like Union Station, but it was a train station that was being redeveloped. So I went up and I fought with the nasty people at KYTC headquarters and I said, you must do this. It's the right thing to do. And uh, two weeks later, they called me back and they said, we'd like to, we'll give you the money for the sidewalks and we'd like to offer you a job as a deputy executive director. And I was like, uh, thank you, but no thank you. Then they told me the salary and I was like, I'd love to do that job. <laughs> Uh, so I became a deputy executive director in Kentucky. Uh, that was a really tough job. Uh, when I when I got on the job, there was uh, there had been a hiring scandal. Uh, there was all sorts of investigations going on, and they asked me to clean it up. And so uh, I said, "Do you want me to clean it up, or do you want me to clean it up?" Because I, I don't I'm not very good at playing this 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 game. And they're like, "No, no, we want you to clean it up." Um, and I was like, "Okay." And then a few weeks into the job, I got a call from a county judge executive now in. Kentucky, the county judge executives are the, are the real power. There's 120 counties. I've heard all the jokes about Delaware, uh, three counties, and yes, there are counties in Colorado larger than Delaware. Well, in Kentucky, there were 120 counties. And uh, those county judge executives are important people. They uh, turn out the vote. They run their counties. And I got a call from one who said, uh, I hear you're, uh, you're hiring for a timekeeper down at your uh, uh, maintenance facility. Um, I just want you to know that my son just graduated from high school. He'd make a fine timekeeper for you. I said, well, sir, I'm, I, just so you know, I, the law says I have to hire the best candidate for the job, so my commitment to you is I'll, on any political call, I'll get your son an interview, but I have to hire the best person for the job. He said, yeah, they told me you'd say that. Maybe you didn't hear me. My son would make a fine timekeeper for you. <laughs> he said, if you don't hire my son, I'm going to call that uh, governor of ours and let him know that we can't, you won't work with us, and we'll get ourselves a new deputy executive director. And, uh, and I said, well, sir, if you can get the governor to call me uh, and, and tell me to do this, then I'll, I'll, I'll resign my job. But they've told me to, to do the right thing, and I'm going to do the right thing. And I hung up the phone, and I was like, oh, man, you know, what if, what if, what if he does that, you know? Um, and I went home that night, and I had a mortgage, and I had a lot of other stuff. And I was like, what difference does it make? You know what I mean? It's a timekeeper job. Uh, and in, in my world, it wasn't that big of a deal. In, in those rural counties, those were, those were big jobs if you weren't. Uh, out there, and I decided I'd rather I'd rather lose the job by doing the right thing, uh, rather than keep it by trying to play the game. And uh, you know, and I'm convinced that if I had not made the right decision that night, that I wouldn't be standing here. I'd still be you know, playing the game 
uh, and and not uh, and not having advanced. And I always do whenever I do leadership development events. I always tell young people when they're coming up is that someday at some point somebody will ask you to do something uh, that you know you shouldn't do and you know it here. And if you make the right decision, good things will happen, even if it means that it might be a little tough for you. Uh, and then I resigned from that job to go work for uh, then Senator uh, Obama's uh, presidential campaign. Um, and uh, I was just a volunteer, and then I got hired, and what turned in what was supposed to be an improbable run turned into a presidency. Uh, then I became, uh, then I got a job at the Federal Highway Administration as an associate administrator, worked on the um, sustainable communities. I just met somebody who worked on the uh, sustainable communities, a partnership between HUD, DOT, and EPA, worked on uh, Tiger Grants. I feel like I really took it to the next level because I actually married a young lady from the EPA. Uh, <laughs> Nobody else was like, we're really bringing these two agencies together. <laughs> so I said, I will, I will, I'm Shailen Bad, I'm reporting for duty, I, I did that. Um, then I became a secretary uh, in Delaware. When I went in there, they were talking about FBI investigations uh, into shady land deals that had, uh, that had gone on. So I was really excited when Don called me and said, you know, um, would you be interested in taking my job? I was like, what sort of an investigation are you under? We have the camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's for you, Don. Uh, and, uh, and he was like, no, 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 nothing like that. And I was like, no, 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 come on, we're friends, let me know. And he was like, no, I'm just, uh, I, I told the governor I would do one term. And I said, okay. So I went home that night and I talked to my wife, which I've learned to do in my marriage. I was, you know, just go home and say, hey, guess what I did today? I took a job in Colorado. Uh, and uh, so I went home that night and I talked to her and she was like, I've always wanted to live in Colorado. I guess when she was, uh, uh, she was a high school te teacher before she went to the EPA and spent some time in Grand Junction, fell in love with it, and had always wanted to live there. And so she said, let's, uh, I'm, I'm on board. I came out, I talked to the governor, and here I am. And that's kind of my background. Um, and I've been on the job for 60 days, uh, and uh, I don't really figure everything out until 90 days, so I'll come back next month when I've got it all figured out. But I've got a few observations. I think one, um, there's a lot of good energy in the state, a lot of excited people around the state who want to talk about transportation, uh, which is good. Um, we have a huge uh, funding challenge. So one of the things I was excited about uh, when uh, working with uh, Deb uh, was to, to lay out our, 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 our long-range plan. Um, less exciting is the fact that that plan is short-funded by $800 million a year. Um, and I asked him, I said, well, because, you know, I've been around this game a little while now. Uh, I said, is that $800 million number, is that a good number? Because in other states, I know people have said, well, let's just throw everything in there. Let's, let's make it a real laundry list so that it'll look really good. It'll make it look like we have a real sh funding shortage. And they said, no, 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 that, that, that number was like a shortfall of $1.5 billion a year. So that $800 million number is a good number, and they are projects that we can deliver, that we are, that we are able to deliver um, if, uh, if we get that funding. But I've also learned uh, there are, in addition to all of our um, transportation acronyms that we always come up with, you know, STIP, TIP, LRTP. Uh, I've learned what TABOR means here in uh, Colorado. I have equally warm uh, feelings for, uh, uh, for that. Uh, and regardless of what my opinions are, it is the law of the land, and we're just going to have to work within, uh, work within that. So um, a few other uh, few things people ask me, what is my vision? My vision is for CDOT to be the best DOT in the country. And what I mean by that is not just, oh, rah, 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 we're the best. I mean, literally a place where people are like, you know, you might have that challenge uh, somewhere else, uh, but you should call Colorado because they've done some cool things. They've got some uh, great ideas about what's going on. And I feel like we have some of that, some elements of that. Um, and, uh, you know, my personal mission when I come to work every day is when I was in Delaware, I, I, we came up with a list of uh, goals for the agency. The only one I added, we had a, a team of people, the only one I added was uh, to make DelDOT. Uh, a, a place where employees love to come to work and can be national leaders in transportation. And I haven't made that official yet at uh, CDOT, but I feel like that is, that is what gets me excited when I come into work every day, and I feel like that is what gives me the ability to lead, inspire, motivate, which is what a lot of you have as a challenge for uh, either your, uh, um, for your cities, your towns, your municipalities, or your organizations. Um, I've also learned that we are 37th out of 50th in, uh, in terms of pavement conditions in the United States, so a lot of improvement uh, left to go uh, there. Um, the Denver metro area, 41 out of 47 metro areas from a congestion standpoint. And I joke about it, I joke about how I've witnessed a lot of road rage, uh, but it's not really a joke because, I mean, there are people who are shaking fists and other 
um, appendages out the window at other people, honking horns, running red lights. Red light running is rampant, uh, you know, here. Um, and uh, there are studies that prove that, you know, that uh, particularly middle-aged men who get very angry uh, when they're sitting in traffic go to work and then they have heart attacks, right? And is it, a, is it the stress? Is it the exposure to um, all the um, exhaust coming out of the, uh, out of the tailpipes? Who knows? But, you know, I think we could all just chill out a little bit. Um, one thing I learned, uh, you know, there are 33,000 deaths annually on American roads. 500 of those uh, are, were here in Colorado. 500 people, you know, just gone. And one third of those were because of uh, seatbelt, you know, lack of a seatbelt. And uh, anybody read uh, Lee Iacocca's autobiography? Um, I, I was a big fan. My dad used to work for Chrysler. And he, he used to talk about in 1965, he was dropping eggs off of ladders onto mattresses to try to make the argument for seatbelts, and people didn't buy it then. The idea that we are still losing people in 2015 to not wearing a seatbelt is just a ridiculous. Um, idea to me, and people make the argument, well, it's, it's a personal right, I don't want the government telling me to wear a seatbelt. Well, guess what, it's my personal right not to have to pay your medical bills, because you wanted to be thrown clear uh, in the event of an accident. So, uh, you know, I, 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 some people say, well, you have a good sense of humor. I have no sense of humor about this. I think that this is something that is incredibly serious and something that I'm going to be talking a lot about. Uh, in addition to all the things about distracted driving, distracted driving is a choice that we need to, to talk to people about. People shouldn't be making uh, bad decisions with regard to their seatbelt. So um, I've talked to the governor a number of times uh, in my first 60 days. We're going to be talking a lot. My sense is uh, some of you may have heard about this uh, trans bond 2 uh, proposal that may or may not be coming out. Um, I'll tell you right now, I haven't seen the bill. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that it, uh, it gives CDOT a bunch of money up front, which is a great idea, except it's our own money. Um, and you don't fix a funding problem with financing. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't say, Let's, here's a bunch of money, which is actually your money for the next 20 years. We'll give it to you up front. Here's a bunch of projects that you go build. And I love building projects. I love delivering projects on time and under budget. Um, but then I can't let the rest of the system deteriorate. What happens to our system that is 37th out of 50th in the country if we don't have the money to maintain those assets? It, it, it's, it's not responsible. It's not the way we want to do it. But I'm happy to have the conversation because I think the, the, the problem is the right problem to address. Um, we've just got to you know, do it in a responsible way. Um, and I'm excited. We've got a lot of great projects that are coming up. We're going to be cutting the ribbon um, on US 36 uh, in the next month. We're just trying to coordinate schedules with Secretary Fox. Well, let's cut the ribbon before we hit the, hit the applause line because this project, unlike a lot of others, instead of just cutting the ribbon and then off the traffic goes, you know, there's an ITS component, there's technology that's involved, so it's a little more complicated, but we've got the steps in place uh, to make sure that that happens well. Bus staying, we just put out today that uh, July 13th, we're going to be, uh, you know, rolling out bus staying. And I used to run transit in Delaware. Um, I used to say that we're the 99th largest transit property. But I have no idea if we are, there's only 106, and I was actually just telling people it was really small. Um, but uh, we ran it, and I think we ran it well. And I am a big transit advocate. I don't think that you can build your way out of congestion. I think you need transit. You need all the solutions to be there. And then uh, we're also very excited about our I-70 East project, a $1.2 billion project that is going to be, frankly, a showcase project for the, for the nation. Uh, as we uh, get that uh, underway, we're going through the RFQ process, and we've got a lot of great companies that uh, are very interested. So I'm excited. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about what I do. And uh, I look forward to working with all of you as we go forward. And I'm happy to open it up to some questions now, or if there's something that you wanted me to address that I didn't. But uh, I'm happy to have a discussion. Commissioner Holland. Well, th thank you for being here and, and uh, being as enthusiastic as you are about the future. Uh, but I have to bring us down to reality. Yeah. Um, the fact that uh, the Highway Trust Fund will be pretty much deleted this year, uh, the fact that there's really no movement uh, that I can see uh, promising in the, in the uh, Congress that, that that will even be addressed in terms of replenishment. Wh what is your view, and, and um, how, can we, uh, how can we help in, in, in making our legislators at least more cognizant of our, our needs? Um, you know, when I was at the Federal Highway Administration, we were, we were dealing at the end of Safety Lou, right? This is before Map 21 and, you know, the umpteen extensions for Safety Lou. And, you know, I have two uh, sort of, I'm, I'm of two minds on this. On the one hand, 
I'm incredibly frustrated because I don't know how many times I would go up there and people would say, oh, yeah, you know, that's the right thing to do, but that's a tough vote. You know, I can remember after the I-35W bridge fell in Minnesota, three months after that. I mean, you talk about a tragedy, that, and we do, right, we, do, we do government by crisis really well, right? So the bridge falls in Minnesota, uh, and, you know, and, and again, it wasn't because of a lack of funding. It was obviously a construction issue and a, a design flaw. But um, if there was ever a time to do it, and I remember a representative from Kentucky saying, well, it, let's not get too extreme and talk about raising the gas tax, because politically that's tough. Well, guess what? Politically tough things are things you have to do sometimes, right? But then the other side of my mind is also that if I'm a member of Congress or an elected official anywhere, um, transportation people are only one of dozens, if not hundreds, of people who are constantly coming to me saying, this is the most important issue, right? Uh, you've got to listen to us about whether it's education or whether it's about health care or all of these issues. And so I think there's some differentiation we need to make. One, I think that we need to stop talking about or start telling the story better, I don't think we should be going out saying the government needs more money for transportation because people think, oh, it's government spending. It's not government spending in the terms of you know, social spending or Medicare or Social Security. This is an investment. This is a necessary investment that if you don't make it, uh, companies won't come and invest in your community. And the second part of it is I think the gas tax uh, is just one option that's out there right now. Uh, a lot of people don't like the gas tax because uh, for one thing, cafe standards are going up to 55 miles a gallon. So that's great on one hand, but it means that our primary revenue source is going to be declining. Um, I think that ve vehicle miles traveled, mileage-based user fee, you know, whatever we're road user charge, whatever we're calling it, because we keep changing the name because it's not very popular, um, you know, that's going to be part of the future. But I think that whatever it is, um, you all have got to be communicating to your elected officials in Washington, D.C., that there are important projects that if they don't go, uh, there are. I'll tell you right now, if I was if I was going to cite my company, right? I think I would look at Colorado. I'd land at DIA and say, "Oh, look at that! Look at that vista! It's beautiful." And then I would get on I-70, and then I would get on I-25, and then I would get on Colorado Boulevard, and I would say, "Hmm, you know, I the vista is beautiful, but I don't want my goods not being able to get to market. I don't want my people being stuck, you know, with all these people honking and waving fists at them. So you know what? Maybe I'll go somewhere else." And without the necessary investment, I think that that's the, that's the future that we look at. So that's the message I would carry over. Commissioner Jones. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, I was happy to hear you mention US 36. A number of us are from the US 36 corridor, and we're very excited about the ribbon cutting. And I, I agree with your comment about we can't just build our way out of congestion. We have to be smarter and more strategic than that. And the US 36 bus rapid transit managed lane project has a transit first component, allows carpools, and has um, a tolling option for single occupancy vehicles. And that's how we paid for that improvement. And we see that as a model that can be used elsewhere in the state. And that, that was a model that was embraced by Don Hunt. I'm curious your vision in moving forward and dealing with capacity challenges. Where does that managed lane type of model fall in your level of priority and thinking? Um, I, one, I was, um, I was relieved earlier to learn that you have a sister, and I, <laughs> and I didn't want to comment about you getting a haircut and getting into all sorts of trouble. So one, I'm glad I have my visions correct. You, you'd yeah. be the only one that didn't get in trouble with it. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think, that, uh, I think that Don and I shared a lot of uh, um, you know, the same mindset, both on asset management, taking care of your existing network before you start adding you know, um, uh, new capacity. Uh, I think we definitely share um, the idea that managed lanes are really the way of the future. And I know that people, there are some people, and forgive me if you're one of those people that don't like them, but where I come from back east, you don't have managed lanes, you have toll roads. So if you don't like a managed lane, let's just toll the whole road and uh, we'll call it a day, right? Um, but I'll tell you, the idea that you would add capacity in this day and age without pricing it is, is is illogical because to me, uh, pricing, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's because the roads function pretty well for 16 out of 24 hours of the day, right? Some places it it might be 12, some places it might be 18, but you predominantly have a congestion issue from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and from maybe 3 p.m. now to about 7 p.m. Right? Why w why would you just add you know you know capacity? when if you just take what you have and use it a little bit smarter, 
In this case, it's pricing, where you can choose to go with the flow of traffic. People call them free lanes. I don't think they're free lanes. I think they're your time, right? Where you're choosing to pay with your time, not with your money, right? But if, if, if this thing, to me, it's the same thing with the issue with water in California, right? It's a commodity that is not priced adequately. In this case, it's the same thing here, where you've got this roadway, you've got a limited amount of capacity, and unless you price it, uh, people are just going to use it indiscriminately. And that's why I think pricing, along with the transit, along with the bike, uh, is the way to provide people with choices. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Tom Hayden, Clear Creek County Commissioner. Thank you very much. We have yet to meet. You've met my compadres, but... Tim Mock was just a <coughs> wonderful, warm, kind, loving gentleman when I met him. I'm surprised to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, uh, welcome, and we look forward to a good relationship in the future. We certainly had it with your predecessor, and a uh, very good working relationship, a lot of trust between Clear Creek County and uh, your organization. Uh, my question is where you stand, um, knowing that um, all the activity on the mountain uh, corridor, as we call it, uh, with the uh, twin tunnel or the veterans tunnel completion and, and now the uh, eastbound peak period shoulder lane um, project. Um, and then we move to the Floyd Hill uh, westbound project and the replacement of the bridge onto the westbound peak period shoulder. Uh, I think everybody knows we're never going to build our way out of this as, um, as our, my uh, Boulder County Commissioner stated, you know, we, we need to be smarter about this. Where do you stand? How do you feel about mass, uh, mass transit in the form of advanced guideway system or high-speed rail? Uh, uh, a few things. One, um, I actually was up in, uh, in Idaho Springs this weekend. Um, wanted to take my wife and my in-laws up into the mountains. I was headed for Frisco because I know Don lives there. I wasn't going to go to his house, but I thought that was a nice, it was a good place to get to. Uh, and my wife is expecting, and she's due uh, at the end of August. And we got halfway over Loveland Pass, and she said she had to, you know, she needed the facilities. And I thought, I don't know what's ahead of me, so I came back. And I just went to the Loveland, uh, uh, you know, ski resort. Um, two things. I think, one, there's a really cool picture that I saw there when, when I went inside. And it showed these uh, 1950s vehicles sitting, uh, and I assume it's the Loveland Ski Resort, and they were all sitting there, um, and uh, they were like Ford Edsels or whatever the, the, the vehicle might have been. And uh, I was thinking they may very well be driving out on the exact same roads that, uh, uh, for the most part, you can't drive the Edsel out of there, but you'll probably drive on the same highway. Uh, and I'll tell you that peak period shoulder lane, I think, is a great idea and a great way to maximize uh, existing asphalt. When I was in uh, in Delaware, I was trying to get them to use the peak period shoulder like they do on I-66 in, in D.C. Uh, during uh, peak tear because it's a great idea. Um, the big challenge, though, is as I was driving back there, I was looking at where the Jersey barrier is, looking at you know sort of the widths and things and thinking, my God, when we have an incident here and there's no shoulder, what's this going to look like? And so from a public safety standpoint, I don't know that it's the ideal uh, you know uh, solution. Uh, and while I agree that US 36 uh, was a good solution, it was also a four-lane road that was carrying 90,000 vehicles a day. And so I think there was an element of capacity that was needed. That, that managed lane that's been added is a capacity uh, addition. So I'm not saying that I don't think that any capacity is necessary. There are sections of I-25 that are still uh, four-lane, right? And that, that in this era with all the trucks and freight that is on those roads in addition to passenger traffic, I think there is an element of capacity. With regard to the advanced guideway system, I know that's part of the record of decision uh, that is out there, and there have been uh, a lot of studies. I came from the Northeast Corridor, where the high-speed rail is all the talk, and the Acela Corridor is where uh, Amtrak makes all of its money. Uh, and, it's, and it's awesome because there's density and it's a viable alternative to 95. It's great to sit on the train and look at all the congestion on 995. I think it would be awesome to be able to develop some sort of a advanced guideway system or rail alternative uh, where you could literally take the train up there and then look out and see congestion on the highway and think, oh, thank goodness I'm not part of that. I think the challenge of the advanced guideway system is that it's got a $13 billion uh, price tag. And so for me, as I look at all of our unfunded needs, it is hard for me to understand under what um, environment, uh, you know, fiscal environment we'd be able to, you know, actively pursue that. So 
under the right circumstances, I'm all for it. I'm all for anything that takes, uh, you know, congestion and, and pollution off of our roadways. But I think that there is a financial component that we're really going to have to have a tough discussion about. Any other questions? I guess I'm going to make a comment. Shailen was at the RTC meeting this week where we've got representatives from RTD, CDOT, and Dr. Cog that sit down and kind of talk about um, the issues that we are all mutual of mutual interest. And I think we all talked about how important it's going to be for the collaboration between the organizations and really working together as these dollars are becoming, transportation dollars are becoming more scarce along with everything else. And I guess from Dr. Cog's perspective, we welcome you and we look forward to that continued cooperation. And, and I guess what, 30 days you'll be back with all the answers. I have it all figured all right. out. <laughs> all all right. right. Thank you very much. Thank I look forward to working time. with all of you. Okay, we are moving on to uh, item number six. It's a presentation on Dr. Cog's roles and responsibilities. Attachment A, Jennifer, and I'm going to be passing some information around. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, <laughs> before I get into this, I just want to introduce you all really quickly for those of you who haven't met your legal counsel. Uh, Sam Light is in the audience this evening. Sam. Uh, walk through my presentation to be sure I'm not telling you anything that's inaccurate. So thanks for being here, Sam. Um, we've got a lot of material to cover in this presentation, so I'll be quick. But uh, it's important that, um, that we take a little bit of time to be sure that everyone understands what's being presented tonight. Uh, the reason that we're doing this this evening is because um, there have been a lot of troubling reports that have been getting back to me. I don't know what you've been hearing, but I've been hearing some really interesting things, and some of it quite disconcerting. Everything from uh, Dr. Cog isn't required to develop a regional plan to um, we're thinking about withdrawing from Dr. Cog or the MPO. Dr. Cog is breaking the law. I don't know what law that is, but it's all very alarming. And I felt that it would be reckless of me not to take some of your time this evening and go through the uh, state and federal uh, requirements that are related to Dr. Cog so that we all are on the same page. Any questions that you have uh, that I can't answer, hopefully uh, Sam can. Uh, but I, again, I want everyone to have, um, to have the facts in front of them. So that's the purpose of this, uh, this evening's presentation. So first I want to talk about um, uh, Dr. Cog uh, as uh, the Regional Planning uh, uh, Commission. And in the, uh, you've got a lot of handouts in uh, attachment A of the agenda. And this is supplemental material that just went around. Um, these are additional uh, relevant rules and regulations, both state statute as well as federal. Uh, there's a, uh, a quick reference guide helping you match up the state statute to the Dr. Carg Articles of Association. There's, uh, like I said, a couple more uh, relevant uh, state statutes that are in that package, another relevant federal reg, and then there's uh, a page from uh, MetroVision 2020 that was adopted back in 19, uh, 1997, and I'll explain that later on in my presentation why that's there. Um, so let me start out by saying that Dr. Cog, as a council of governments, is voluntary. Um, there are a couple of the, in your, the, the information that was just passed around, uh, those two uh, parts of the um, um, uh, state statute are, are in that uh, thing that went around tonight. But basically what those two things do is allow two or more political subdivisions to get together and form an association to work at, uh, towards their uh, mutual uh, welfare and benefit. And then there's uh, the other one that's in there has to do with uh, contracting. It allows you to, con Dr. Cog, uh, to contract with, with other governments. Um, as regional planning commission, so you are organized under uh, CRS 3028105. I promise I won't read all this stuff, but this is the information that re uh, pertains to regional planning commission statutes. And it's also where the county uh, 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 planning statutes are located. But as, um, as a uh, regional planning commission formed also for transportation planning, that's CRS 43, et cetera, et cetera, 
Um, Dr. Cog is responsible for carrying out cooperative and co comprehensive transportation planning for the region and considering what priorities are um, in the regional transportation plan when you develop the TIP. Dr. Cog is also uh, organized under laws relating to, well, and I just told you about that, the laws associated with um, uh, associations of governments and nonprofits. So let's talk about what's in uh, the Colorado Revised Statutes related to planning commissions. Again, any group of cities and counties, cities and counties, uh, can all form an, our, uh, a regional planning commission. As the regional planning commission, Dr. Cog decides how many members it's going to have, what, if any member qualifications there are going to be, what the terms of office will be. Um, and the statute says that all member governments have at least one voting representative. It also talks about electing a chair, um, they're eligible for re-election, um, and you can create other offices in addition to the chair which you have in your articles. We have a chair, we have a vice chair, secretary, treasurer. Um, the statute also explains that members can agree on dues allocations and that dues can be used to pay for staffing, contracting, uh, services, facilities, and the like. The next section of the reg uh, talks about um, expending funds. Again, you can contract with uh, other legal entities. You are a, a, bo a excuse me, a body politic, a, a, a corporate, meaning that you can sue, and as an organization, you can be sued. Let me grab my. You have the power to, and you have adopted uh, articles of association that regulate and govern your affairs. And uh, that uh, same um, article talks about the records that you have to keep in order to um, um, have a good accounting of the transactions that you're involved in, the, the contracts that you've signed, that sort of thing. And all those things are, are made public. Um, that particular um, reg goes on to talk about uh, you can perform, actually, this, is, this was interesting probably to a lot of you, although I'm sure that none of you will ever ask this. Um, Dr. Cog can perform the functions of a county planning commission uh, to the extent that uh, the Board of County Commissioners asked them to do. So um, uh, if you wanted Dr. Cog to, to play that role, uh, you could. I don't know what the circumstances would be that that would occur, but uh, the statute allows for it. It also says that if Dr. Cog needs support that um, member jurisdictions can delegate some work to their staff uh, to help get the Dr. Cog work done or they could even assign uh, staff to come and work at Dr. Cog. I, I'm unaware of us ever doing this um, uh, formally anyway over the last uh, decade. Uh, the next part of the statute uh, talks about it's Dr. Cog's duty to make and adopt a regional plan and, and I'm going to call that plan Metro Vision from here on out. That's what we've called it for uh, almost two decades. Um, the Metro Vision plan is an advisory document to guide um, land development decisions. And I think one of the things that I've heard some confusion around is whether or not the Metro Vision plan supersedes uh, planning commissions uh, uh, comp plan or any other plan that they might adopt. And it does not unless the uh, planning commission adopts uh, the Dr. Cog uh, plan for that purpose. So this doesn't supersede anything that uh, any of, of you are doing uh, in, the, in your individual counties. <clears throat> when we adopt the Metro Vision Plan, the statute says that we have to provide public notice, we have to encourage uh, public participation and awareness of the plan. Um, we need to um, uh, include in the plan recommendations for development within the Dr. Cog boundary. And it specifically says that you may, uh, as a planning commission, consider the availability of affordable housing in the region. And I only point that out because that is, that is specifically called out and, and you have a copy of the statute so you can see that yourself. Um, the statute goes on to talk about um, what you need to be considering when you're putting the plan together that you need to be looking at existing conditions but also projected growth in the region. Um, 
And a lot of this language is actually in your uh, articles of association as well, but it says that you need to um, have coordinated development based on those current needs and, and available resources that the plan needs to promote health and safety and the prosperity and general welfare of the residents of the region. We have to consider the uh, distribution of the population and the uses of the land, all to create the conditions that provide the most favorable um, uh, environment for the health, safety, uh, transportation, civic activities, uh, cultural opportunities, and so on. There is a, a, this is a summary. Um, you have the statute. I'm just kind of hitting the high points to take some of the mystery out of what Dr. Cog's responsibilities are. Um, it also says that uh, we should tend toward an efficient economic uh, use and conservation of food, water, drainage, uh, and uh, other resources. Um, the statute says that you can adopt MetroVision uh, as a whole. It's a complete um, uh, plan for the region, or you can adopt it in parts if, if it's, uh, those parts are contributing to the uh, development of the whole. So uh, the best example I can uh, provide of that right now is uh, several months ago, probably now a year and a half or more, um, the board said, you know what, the issue of urban growth boundary slash area is way too big of an issue to, to discuss in the next Metro Vision plan, the 2040 plan. So let's just leave urban growth boundary area alone in the, uh, in the plan. And once we get the plan adopted, then we'll talk about urban growth boundary and we'll adopt that any changes uh, into the plan at a later date. So that's a good example of uh, adopting it as a whole versus um, uh, the whole or in parts. Um, you can amend the plan. You can um, uh, take any part of the plan and, and carry it out in, in a lot greater detail. And the statute also says that the adoption of the plan or amendment, extension, addition, uh, has to be approved by resolution by the affirmative votes of not less than the majority of the entire membership. Well, what does that mean? We have 56 members here, Dr. Cog, you divide that by two, it's 28. Uh, you add one to it to um, um, uh, make it the majority, so it would take 29 votes to meet the state statute. Um, it also says that uh, Dr. Cog has to certify a copy of the MetroVision plan or its amendments to the membership. And while you can't see it that great on my slide, you can maybe see it just a little bit better in, um, in your copy. But uh, inside, the, this graphic here is the uh, inside cover of the uh, MetroVision 2035 document and the certification uh, is listed there. A resolution is also on file. Um, it, not unlike the, uh, the language that I mentioned a few minutes ago, it does say uh, in this section, again, that any member or county planning commission can adopt all or part of MetroVision into their master plan. And if they were to do that, it carries the same force and effect that, um, of any other plan that that uh, commission would have, have uh, adopted on its own. There are some additional uh, regulations that are laid out, uh, and, and you do have a copy of that in your, uh, in your package, but they don't, uh, they don't apply uh, to anything right now. It's really uh, talking about if Dr. Cog were acting in place of a county commission, and that's not happening anywhere. So um, that's a really quick summary of Dr. Cog operating as a Council of Governments and a Regional Planning Commission. Anyone have any questions or concerns about anything you heard? Um, anything you want to talk about before I move on to your responsibilities as an MPO? Commissioner Partridge, excuse me. Yes, I, I will certainly make a point. I think, first of all, I want to clear the air a little bit. Uh, at the uh, last board officer meeting, I would say a couple weeks ago, I think Douglas County was called out inappropriately by our, our director, executive director. It, it didn't appreciate that. I think it was bad form. I think we'll take that up later. Uh, just want to clear that air. All these questions raised were certainly not from Douglas County. We did have a few questions raised. I think it was handled in a very poor form, and Jennifer will talk more on that later. 
Uh, I do. I will reserve more comments for another time, but I think there's a, a little bit more to add to uh, some of the presentations already been presented. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Jennifer at this point? Okay, Jennifer. While legal counsel is here, even if you don't want to talk about it with me, Roger, if you want to grab Sam at some point, uh, I would encourage you to, because uh, he's definitely the the expert on on the uh, planning commission um, statute. So let me give you a really brief overview, too, of the MPO requirements. And again, this is not to be considered complete, and I've given you even more information on federal statutes uh, uh, this evening in addition to what was already in your package, and there's actually even more that exists. I just didn't think that we needed to, to go through it uh, all this evening. Um, uh, the... Um, uh, portion of the uh, United States um, Code 23, which is about highways, there's a section 134, and it talks about metropolitan transportation planning. Um, so just in case you didn't know, MPOs were established um, in the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1962. Uh, the code talks about how they felt, uh, Congress felt it was in the national interest to encourage and promote safe and efficient transportation systems uh, to uh, efficiently and effectively move uh, uh, people and goods and foster economic growth and development. Um, and whatever uh, the MPO could do to minimize fuel-related uh, uh, consumption and air pollution, they wanted to see that sort of thing too. Um, the uh, uh, code lays out uh, some planning factors. These are to guide the MPO process. I'll talk about those in just a moment. Um, MPOs were created to be this policy-making organization of local governments and transportation authorities. And MPOs are required for urbanized areas with a population greater than 50,000. So those planning factors that uh, Congress uh, and the law expect us to look at um, are, are listed here, uh, supporting the economic vitality of the metro area, increasing the safety and security of the system, increasing accessibility and mobility of people and freight, protecting and enhancing um, uh, the natural environment, uh, integrating connectivity across modes of transportation, promoting uh, efficient systems management and operations, and uh, again, pres not unlike um, Shaylin just mentioned, preserving the existing system before you continue to build uh, new uh, components of the system. Uh, the federal code requires certification by uh, USDOT. Uh, this is to ensure that MPOs and the planning process that MPOs have in place is carried out in accordance with uh, the federal laws that we're talking about right now. Uh, the feds come in and certify uh, the MPO, at least for here in uh, this region, uh, at least once every four years to be sure that these requirements are being met. And on an annual basis, Dr. Cog has to submit what's called a self-certification, uh, addressing all those things that the feds would normally look at when they're here every four years to show that we're uh, meeting all of the, the federal rules and regulations. Just to give you just a little bit of history on the Dr. Cog MPO, uh, a long time ago, uh, back in the early 70s actually, there was a, a long dispute between uh, what was then the Colorado Department of Highways, now uh, Transportation, RTD, and Dr. Cog. They were all competing to become uh, the MPO. And it was actually Governor Land that made uh, uh, the designation of Dr. Cog as MPO in 1977. Um, but Governor Lamb did stipulate, because there had been this long dispute over who would take on these responsibilities, that there had to be some sort of agreement between RTD, CDOT, and Dr. Cog as to how the transportation planning process for the Denver region was governed. Um, some of you have heard about a memorandum of agreement between uh, the three agencies. That's what that is. It lays out that relationship. And the other place that you see this um, uh, partnership in planning the transportation, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, carrying out the transportation planning process is at your uh, regional transportation committee. RTD is there, CDOT is there, 
Dr. Cog is there, and then there uh, is an air quality uh, rep and a couple of uh, other representatives that typically represent business and industry. So this is the Dr. Cog boundary uh, outlined in red there. This is the entire Dr. Cog boundary in red. The gray area is the MPO area. So you'll see that uh, the mountains and the uh, eastern plains areas are not within the MPO. So there is a difference between uh, the Dr. Cog boundary and the MPO boundary. So related to the Transportation Improvement Program, that's what I wanted to, to focus on most. Um, Here's basically what the regs say about that, and again, you have the relevant um, information in your package and, and passed around earlier. So your TIP um, uh, has to cover no less than a four-year period of time. It has to be consistent with uh, your regional transportation plan, and I'll take you through how all these things are connected in just a moment. The TIP has to be fiscally constrained. Either the money is there or it's reasonably anticipated to be there at the time the project is listed uh, in the TIP. It has to include all regionally significant projects regardless of the funding type. So even a private uh, toll road, for example, uh, would have to be uh, incorporated into the TIP. A project that was all local dollars that was regionally significant would also have to be in the TIP. The TIP has to be compatible with the state's transportation improvement uh, uh, program. And uh, the feds have to make uh, an air quality determination to be sure that um, uh, implementing those projects that are in the TIP aren't going to um, uh, tip the scale, so to speak, and uh, put us into a, a worse uh, air quality uh, situation. The um, the regs say that, um, again, the TIP has to be consistent with the RTP, and that's, that's going back to those planning factors where we consider economic vitality, safety and security, accessibility, uh, all of those things. Um, the TIP is, it has to be designed in a way to make forward progress on a number of things, reducing traffic fatalities, maintaining the system in a state of good repair, reducing congestion on the national highway system, strengthening access to uh, markets, supporting regional, or, uh, uh, regional economic development, and enhancing uh, system performance again while protecting the natural environment. So I've heard some concern about how uh, the plans, the MetroVision plan is connected to the TIP and the RTP, so I kind of want to walk through that really quickly as well. So this all began, um, this, this connection between MetroVision uh, and the TIP began uh, with the development of MetroVision 2020. And I, in the handout this evening that you received, the, there's a, a page out of the MetroVision uh, 2020 plan pertinent to this slide. Um, this process began here at Dr. Cog to, to blend these two things, began in 1990. And the, they adopted a vision for that plan in 1992, but the first MetroVision plan wasn't actually adopted until 1997. But the 2020 MetroVision vision talked about creating a stronger, more livable region that had to do with strengthening um, individual communities and at the same time promoting a really high quality of life for the entire region, uh, the, making the region a place where people could live, work, and play. Those of you who have been involved in MetroVision uh, to any extent at all, th these words will sound very familiar to you because they've just been repeated in um, uh, MetroVision plans if, as they've been developed. Um, the vision also talked about having the region function as an association of interrelated uh, communities, but they were all responding to in, a, in a way that dealt with their own individual issues while having a stake in uh, the region as a whole. Uh, speaking about attaining the vision, uh, the 2020 plan talks about, and this is a quote from the plan, a key mechanism to implementation 
talking about implementing the plan, uh, the MetroVision plan, transportation improvement um, uh, is the transportation improvement program evaluation criteria. So that was the beginning of it. This has been going on since 1977. That was a decision that was made uh, a long time ago. Um, so let's talk about how these plans kind of affect one another. So the MetroVision plan, as I mentioned in the um, uh, the, that short briefing on the state statute, it's to guide coordinated growth based on current and future needs and resources, and it has to consider the um, distribution of population, land use, uh, all those things that create a favorable, uh, high-quality uh, environment uh, for the residents of the region. The MetroVision uh, Regional Transportation Plan, it's kind of got two parts. There's uh, a needs plan, uh, which explains what we think we need in transportation uh, facilities and projects and uh, resources over the next 20 years to serve the existing population, but also the population that we anticipate will be here in the next 20 years. Um, it takes its cues from the requirements, uh, those, those federal uh, planning factors again, uh, economic vitality and safety and security and so on, and MetroVision. From the, tra the regional transportation plan, we get the regional uh, transportation plan that's fiscally constrained. This is a requirement of the feds. Um, the feds know that there is no way that you're ever going to have the money to do everything you need to do. So based on what you said your needs are, what do you plan to fund over the next 20 years with the money that you do think that you're going to, uh, uh, you can reasonably anticipate? Uh, the feds require uh, a 20, a minimum 20-year uh, planning horizon for the uh, regional transportation plan. When the, what we do next, <laughs> this is sort of, I guess, a little bit out of sequence, but you have your MetroVision plan, you have the regional transportation plan that uh, comes from that, uh, you have your fiscally constrained plan that comes from that, and then you have uh, the transportation improvement program. These are the projects that you intend to build over the next four years. Um, so the process that uh, you have in place right now says that you develop and adopt um, a, a policy on how this preparation of the TIP is going to take place. You're going to estimate how much funding you're going to have over the next four years. You're going to talk about who's eligible to apply. Um, can any jurisdiction apply? And that's the way it's worked in the past. But there have been, for example, there are um, uh, the Museum of History, uh, or History Colorado, next door to us, uh, at one point was allowed to apply for funds. So um, uh, you have, you go through this process to talk about who's, who's eligible to apply. What's the maximum number of applications that you can submit? This is largely based on um, size of a jurisdiction, um, but at least right now, um, so some jurisdictions can only submit uh, two or three projects where others can submit seven or eight or more. Uh, what's the minimum amount requested? And this is really uh, in large part related to a contracting issue. It's, uh, you all know being members of local government, um, uh, the expense uh, and administrative overhead of, it, of administering contracts. So um, uh, CDOT doesn't like to administer. They, don't, they would much rather administer um, a couple of contracts for uh, you know, a few million dollars as opposed to um, several hundred contracts for under $200,000. So um, that's in part why that minimum uh, requested amount it has become part of the, um, uh, the, the process. Then you establish some evaluation criteria. It's up to you what that is. Uh, you solicit a call for projects. Uh, you conduct a project uh, selection process um, where you're actually uh, looking at um, your criteria against the submittals and, and determining uh, who 
who's presented the, the submittals that most, um, that best match uh, the criteria that you've laid out. And then the board and the Regional Transportation Commission that I talked about just a minute ago, they both have to concur on what goes into the final tip. And that's again because of that memorandum of agreement that says CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog will all participate in this in a way that they've agreed to in advance. Um, currently, um, tip scoring is, um, we have about 25 uh, points that are pretty specific to MetroVision. For example, it talks about the proximity of urban uh, centers and rural town centers. Uh, it talks about uh, the proximity of the project to uh, urban uh, and rural uh, town centers, the proximity uh, of the project to uh, the urban growth boundary, uh, the proximity of the project to job growth or environmental justice areas, whether or not uh, the, um, uh, the project sponsor has signed Dr. Cog's Mile High Compact. Uh, there's an additional 75 points, the way the system works right now, uh, that are consistent with MetroVision and the federal requirements, um, but um, are, are really pretty, um, I, th I think what most people would agree is pretty straightforward as far as related to transportation, uh, reducing emissions, improving congestion, providing multimodal connectivity, uh, improving safety, uh, lots of those. Uh, I know that You've got a tip in front of you tonight, actually, and, but I know that not everyone has been on, on the ground floor of developing that, so I just wanted to be specific about um, how those points were, um, or what, what points are in there and for what purposes. So to make a long story short, um, the federal requirements are really silent on actual tip criteria. Uh, as long as the projects that you put in the TIP are consistent with the Regional Transportation Plan, thinking back again on those, those factors about safety and security and accessibility and so on. Um, Dr. Cog, any MPO actually, has very wide latitude and flexibility in how you go about selecting projects. I'm telling you how it works right now. Um, during the last federal certification, Dr. Cog was uh, uh, commended, this is not a self-certification, but the feds actually being here for several days, uh, commended Dr. Cog for including uh, livability and sustainability principles um, as part of the TIP, and, and most of that comes directly from um, uh, the tenets of, of MetroVision. Uh, they also in, uh, recommended that uh, the board think about uh, more emphasis on environmental justice issues in project selection and actually the tip that you're adopting tonight, it does just that. Um, and I'll wrap up by uh, talking about withdrawing from the organizations. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this um, presentation, Dr. Cog is, is voluntary. Um, no jurisdiction has to be at the table and pay dues. That no, none of that is <clears throat> uh, required. Um, certainly uh, an organization leaving Dr. Cog and not paying dues anymore uh, could have um, short or even um, uh, uh, longer term financial challenges for us. We use uh, dues for a couple of purposes, one to pay our lobbying staff, but also to provide that federal local match that uh, is required of us. Um, not having a seat at the table could create challenges for uh, member, current member jurisdictions. As far as the MPO goes, uh, the code, uh, and that was passed around this evening, um, uh, the highway code, the section 134, again it requires that an urbanized area of 50,000 or more have an MPO. Um, and there can be a designation of more than one PO more than one MPO in a region if both the governor and the existing MPO, this body, were to determine that the Denver uh, metro region, the size and complexity of the planning issues it's faced with actually warranted um, a second MPO. So it is, it is possible, but it's probably um, would be a, a, a kind of tough case to make. Um, but I want you to know what the, what the regs say and, and give you access to um, the actual rules and regulations. So 
Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about Dr. Cog's MPO, RPC, Cog. Um, uh, Sam is here, as I said. Uh, Doug is here as well. He's well familiar with the federal rules and regs as well. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Are there any questions? Yes. Just for purposes of clarification, to make sure I understand MetroVision and TIP connectivity. So there's actually 100 possible points, 25 specific to MetroVision, 75 consistent with MetroVision. Is it? Yeah, I think that you could say that any of the points are consistent with what's in the MetroVision plan now, but there are 25 points consistent, I mean specific. Uh, uh, to MetroVision, and I just listed some that I thought maybe you'd be more familiar with than, than others. But you all, I, mm, when was that? November, December? Yeah. Well, it's not been that long ago. In the, in the last uh, six months, uh, this board and, and MBIC had some long conversations about what the TIP criteria should be. Um, uh, I think um, signing the Mile High Compact, for example, uh, was uh, an issue of debate. And um, in the current uh, TIP, it's getting one less, your project gets one less point if you sign the Mile High Compact than it did uh, in the last TIP cycle. So, but every time it's time to do a TIP, all that criteria is up for grabs and, and you have the opportunity to talk about it. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Partridge. Again, I certainly have some questions, but I just ask to reserve the right to bring questions up at another date. And uh, certainly to speak with the attorney, realizing there may be time involved with that, but I will uh, take that up at a hand with the board. But again, reserve the right to review and ask questions at a later date. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Cernanek, did I see a hand? Yes. He always asks the tough questions. I know. I, <laughs> Mayor Sinanik, we're running late. <laughs> uh, thank you. Just wanted to, um, you know, a, a distinction that uh, um, I believe is there, uh, which is the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan in, in saying that it takes its cues from MetroVision is that um, though there are cues, it doesn't necessarily exactly have to follow or the expectation is that it would exactly have to follow MetroVision because MetroVision um, will be broader, uh, includes more partners, uh, and goes beyond transportation. So when it does come to the the tip, and so I'm asking for these, mm -hmm. at least uh, am I correct in that, uh, that uh, our tip process and when we have that uh, up for grabs at our next tip cycle, uh, whatever we're, we we do put into the Metro Vision plan is not necessarily exactly a, we're not committing our tip process scoring to be that at this time. That is right. Um, as I said earlier, the the federal language does not require. It's silent on um, what uh, on, on projects to go into the tip. Uh, as long as the TIP is consistent with the Regional Transportation Plan. So back in 1997, the board married these two things together. You get the opportunity uh, every four years to uh, decide what that TIP criteria is going to look like, what it's going to be based on, how you're going to um, uh, select projects. As I've said to a few people, you know, we could take all the submittals and we could throw them up in the air, and the ones that land face up, you could fund. Uh, assuming that they were all consistent with the Regional Transportation Plan. And my Part B uh, is... Um, I can give you a Part B. <laughs> That's okay, this I'll is, take this it. This is going to be the all hard right. part now. <laughs> no. the, um, for example, I mean, we're currently um, at the verge of an exp expiration of the Highway Trust Fund uh, legislation. Um, conceivably in a next cycle, if it does have a longer term frame, which is what many of us would desire, uh, but we don't know that for sure. It can uh, maybe enhance some of the accountability that occurs with that. So for example, um, the MAP 21 ephemeral measurements uh, and uh, that level of accountability could end up being part of our, and this is hypothetical, but could be part of our next tip selection mm -hmm. cycle uh, as that may or may not become crystallized. 
That is true as well, and, and Deb may be able to speak to this a little bit. Those, those planning factors about economic vitality and safety and security and accessibility, mobility, et cetera, they, the feds and, and, and the state DOTs in particular and some other interest groups that are out there are um, thinking about, you know, trying to figure out what the uh, performance measures ought to be. We thought that they would be, have been promulgated long before now, but yes, it is highly possible uh, that uh, there will be some additional federal guidance uh, by the time we get to a new tip that uh, we have to look, we have to look at uh, more than we have to look at right now in selecting projects. Thank you. I think Council Member Nevitt had a question, comment, question? Yes, thank you. First off, maybe it's just the way my mind works, but I gotta say this, this kind of history lesson is the most clear explication of what the hell Dr. Cog is <laughs> that I have ever gotten in all my now time Now that you're here. leaving. <laughs> yeah. So now I get it. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, Thank you for your service. <laughs> that's so appropriate. Um, so uh, at, a, at a much higher level than, than Mayor Cernanek was talking about, sort of thinking about the enterprise here, is it fair to say that MetroVision is the, the 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 instrument that marries together the two different functions that Dr. Cog plays. Dr. Cog is an entity, but Dr. Cog is the regional planning commission, which has a whole set of responsibilities that derive from state statute and a whole set of uh, things we're supposed to look at. And then we have our responsibilities as a Metropolitan Planning Organization for Transportation that's authorized by and governed by and directed to look at a different set of uh, considerations. MetroVision is our way of marrying those two pieces, the Metropolitan Land Planning and the issues there and the Transportation Planning. That that's, that's what MetroVision does. That's why it's such a big deal. That's, and, and, and it's consistency with are being the MPO is not to be, it, it's not perfectly consistent with that enterprise. It's a little bigger than that enterprise because it also reflects the other half of this union, which is as a regional planning, or whatever the damn thing is, the regional planning commission. Right. So it's, the, the, it, it, MetroVision marries these two pieces and consequently isn't entirely consistent with either one. Well, I, I would say that but we have some that's cognitive dissonance when we I, think I, about it. Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, the board decided to marry MetroVision and, transporta uh, and, and transportation. One of the things that's kind of left out of this history is that um, one of the reasons Dr. Cog felt like it should be the MPO was because it was already the RPC and had all of these planning duties, so it just made sense that they would have the transportation planning duties as well to have CDOT, or Department of Highways at the time, do it. it they, they work at a much bigger scale, uh, and RTD is a much right. smaller scale, so it just made uh, sense at the time, I think, uh, uh, to the right. board to, to go after right. this responsibility of Metroplan uh, uh, metropolitan planning organization because it fits so neatly with um, no, no, I think their, their uh, I think existing it's duties. I'm totally down with the program. I just it, now that you're leaving. Yeah, now that I <laughs> finally figured out what the hell we're doing. Okay, Council Member Teal. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so um, I was actually a history major at the good old University of Northern Colorado <laughs> back in college. So now that we've, as Chris said, have gotten this great history lesson, um, I think it's appropriate to ask what uh, one of my professors said at a senior level class. So we've heard the history, so what? Big deal, who cares? That's the history. Why do we study history? Why do we need this history lesson tonight? Because it's the past, right? The answer is no, it's not the past, it's the now. 
So the idea that we have to do, and I thought, Chris, you, you said it just really great there, that you know the Metro Vision is the thing that ties these two responsibilities together. And I would just remind everyone, for all the briefing that we've received tonight pertaining to not having to tie Metro Vision principles to the tip, that there's been a lot of tying of those that has gone on over the last year. And so when we talk about moving forward in time over the next few months and we're crafting this new Metro Vision, I'd like us to all remember, it's not just history. It's not just academia. It's not just great ideas because in the years that come, in the years before us, in the months before us, someone will say when trying to argue for a TIP criteria point, well, it's a MetroVision principle. So I think the history lesson is great, by the way. Uh, I'm with you 100%. Luckily, I'm just starting out. <laughs> Lucky you. Is that scary or not scary to everyone? No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, we are behind, but if there is any other, this, this conversation I think is going to continue, but is there anything, not tonight, unless anybody has something else. Okay, wonderful. We're going to thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, we're going to move on to the report of the chair, which I promise you will be brief. Um, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., you will uh, be able to go online and get uh, participate in the assessment tool, a board collaboration assessment uh, for 2015. It is going, it's going to be used to continue to improve the work that we do at the Dr. Cog board table. Um, the board officers are really strongly encouraging everyone to participate and, and all the board members to participate. And um, while your participation responses will be anonymous, we will know who actually does complete the assessment. And we will, we will, Bob will be calling you <laughs> if you have not completed. I am, I'm totally going to blame. You're the secretary. That's your job. Um, maybe he will get some help from the rest of us. Okay. This is, uh, it was, let me give you a little background. It's going to be conducted annually. Uh, the results are for the board to review and implement improvement plans based upon the information and comments that you make through this assessment. Um, please be very candid in your responses. We can only improve this organization if you let us know how you would like to see it improved. It should not take more than 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, let me see. Uh, the assessment will be emailed to each board member tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, and there will be a link to access the site. And um, Jerry, can you let me know who the very first person is who completes this? <laughs> who we, all right. So somebody will get something from me for the very first person that completes this. And there will be a booby prize for the person who completes it at the last one to complete this. So um, I think I've covered it all. Um, we are going to provide the report to you during our, is it our May meeting? And this assessment will close on April 26th, okay? So uh, that said, I'm also going to let you know what happened at RTC. We approved the tip. So hopefully we will do that this evening and we can put this baby to bed. And I will um, also just uh, ask you guys to forgive me. I will be leaving at 9 o'clock this evening and Elise Jones will be taking over. Lucky, you see? So Maybe we could all just, just leave at 9. Yeah, and, and if, you, yeah, if it all works together, we could all leave at 9. I like the way she's thinking. Pardon? Oh, no. Okay. So uh, with that, Jennifer, do you have anything else you need to report? Uh, just really yeah. quick. Okay. Uh, mark your calendars now. The June board meeting is going to be canceled. Woohoo! <laughs> June. Or this is the annual conflict CML. with CML's uh, conference, so just... Take it off your calendar um, if you're with the county party. I think, I think the county commissioners should all come. <laughs> they can't do anything, but they should all have to show up. Uh, I want to remind you, too, that if you're currently on MVIC or you're not and you want to be on the Metro Vision Issues Committee, you have to get your um, statement of interest into Connie by April 22nd. That's, next, uh, that's a week from today. 
And speaking of a week from today, uh, that's the evening of the Dr. Cog's 60th uh, anniversary bash uh, down at the Sewell Ballroom. So if you haven't registered, do so right away. Uh, you don't want to miss um, you don't want to miss this. And uh, the last thing I just want to call your attention to uh, item 16, attachment I. This isn't a staff presentation, but at a previous uh, board meeting, uh, staff was asked what the um, uh, ongoing public participation uh, process would be for the MetroVision plan as you start editing it. Uh, so that is laid out in item 16, attachment I. Please uh, take a look at that. If you have any questions or concerns, give me or um, uh, Brad Calvert a call. His name is on the uh, is on the agenda item. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Now we're moving on to public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated at this time for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting. The chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Is there anyone here this evening for public comment? Uh, I see some hands and people moving, so I'm, saying, I'm thinking yes. Our esteemed former chair, Mr. Jim Taylor. Good evening. I am going to read you a letter from the governor. It's addressed to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. We are pleased that the governor's office was asked to participate in the executive committee of the Sustainable Communities Initiative, which Dr. Cog has skillfully managed. It is a continued testament to the spirit of regional collaboration that allows us all to advance the ambitious goals and objectives that were addressed by the initiative. We believe that the executive committee's recommendations, which reflect more than three years of listening, discussing, researching, contemplating, and debating, will advance not just the Denver region, but the entire state of Colorado forward on a more vibrant economy, healthier environment, and higher quality of life for all of our residents and visitors. These recommendations and the final reports represent the culmination of all these efforts associated with the Sustainable Com Communities Initiative. More importantly, these reports represent the beginning of all the work all of us should be conducting. We should be eager to cancer all the opportunities that have been identified by this work, the key partnerships that have been established, the critical trends that have been identified, the new ideas that will help grow our economy and provide meaningful opportunities to, for families of all uh, rungs of the economic ladder, and the opportunity to capitalize on the massive investments we all continue to make in our transportation network, especially our growing transit system here in the region, and act on them. We especially want to commend the staff of Dr. Cog and all the key players who helped make this happen, members of the consortium, the executive committee, and all the various committees that stakeholder groups that were closely involved. Denver and Colorado are increasingly being recognized as places where innovation just doesn't happen. It's in our DNA. So while it's truly time to celebrate a job well done, it's also time to understand that our work is just beginning. Congratulations to you all. Signed, John Hicker and Luther, Governor. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brad Weinig. I am the um, Senior Transit-Oriented Development Program Manager for Enterprise Community Partners, and I'm also a Priority Area Coordinator for, for Mile High Connects. Um, I've been personally involved with the Sustainable Communities Initiative work here at Dr. Cog since the beginning, and in fact, I was part of the team that helped uh, write the successful application, and I'm very proud to be a member of uh, the coordinating and executive committees for the Sustainable Communities Initiative, and I'm very proud of the tremendous effort that Paul Aldretti and your great staff here at Dr. Cog have put forth over the last three plus years in leading a very dynamic, multifaceted, and extremely complex scope of work. The Sustainable Communities Regional Principles that you will hear about from Mr. Taylor later this evening represent a culmination of the knowledge gained and the lessons learned throughout this multi-year journey of new and different models for cross-jurisdictional collaboration, community engagement, regional planning, and knowledge sharing. The Executive Committee, a broad and diverse group of regional business, government, philanthropic, and nonprofit leaders, believes that these principles are the foundation upon which we can all build upon to ensure that this great region reaches its fullest potential by collectively tackling these opportunities and challenges. These are not the sole responsibilities of Dr. Cog. They're not meant to be, and nor should they be. These principles are far too broad and far-reaching for any one organization to tackle alone. 
However, as the organization responsible for the long-term range vision and plan for this region, you do have a unique role to play as a leader, a policymaker, and a convener. And there are dozens of organizations, including my own, ready to jump in with you and work towards this vision, but we need Dr. Cog to make it a reality. So please join me, my colleagues on the SCI Executive Committee, and the many in this room and throughout the region who have supported these efforts, provided monetary and or staffing resources towards this work for the past three years. Honor our work, honor the work of your great staff, and adopt these principles as your own and our own. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Good evening. Uh, my name is Aaron Maripol. I'm the president of the Urban Land Conservancy. We're a 501c3 nonprofit uh, real estate company. We work in the metro area. We're one of your key partners, I would like to think. Um, so I want to just read a little bit of what our letter that we sent to uh, Dr. Cog earlier. Um, we're, we've been honored to be a, a participant as an executive committee member um, on the Sustainable Communities Initiative. Over the last three years, Dr. Cog has done an excellent job in managing this extensive and, quite frankly, sometimes challenging planning process. Um, thanks again, Paul, and to the staff, uh, to Joe and his leadership, Mr. Taylor as well, um, and to uh, the chair of the SCI committee, uh, Chris White. Um, I also want to just give you a little bit of background. So we've done about $60 million in real estate investment in the metro area. $40 million of that is at transit corridors, so 19 different investments in your metro area. The vast majority, 90% of that is private equity that we bring to the table, 10% is public support. So um, to do this work successfully really requires this adoption, uh, hopefully, of the five principles that you're going to hear more about. Um, the five regional principles established by the committee present Dr. Cog with a unique and timely chance to become a leader in the areas that will advance economic opportunities for all residents in the metro region. With the metro area facing a 58,000 unit gap in affordable housing, and again, 58,000 unit gap, and this came through a study that the Home Builders and the Housing Colorado and P-Town Foundation and Mile High Connects presented back in January. We have some serious challenges. And I would tell you that doing affordable housing is a major economic impact factor. So we've seen in that study the number of jobs that come from affordable housing, the long-term revenue it brings for communities, and what it does for tax base, et cetera. ULC continues to focus on equitable de development, identifying opportunities across the region for healthy communities to be developed in existing and future transit sites. We ask Dr. Cog continue to lead the efforts to capitalize on the massive rail and bus investments that are already being made in the region and to work to create ways to begin the implementation of the five principles. Dr. Cog and its partners now have an opportunity to implement the catalytic plans resulting from our collaborative work, achieving our goals to increase economic opportunities across the region. You can count on us, ULC, to support the implementation of the work. I got 30 seconds, so the big part is the implementation. I'm going to just pass around here a map that was done through partnership with Mile High Connects, the P-Town Foundation, and Urban Land Conservancy. And it has a map of the region and the amount of affordable housing, subsidized affordable housing that we have in the region. So front's a map, and the other side shows the units of affordable rental housing that we have in the region. And as you heard, we have a huge gap, and you can see, as a region, we have to do more. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maripol. Hi, I'm Desa West. I'm the Executive Director of Mile High Connects, and I just wanted to lend our voice um, also to our support for the Sustainable Communities Initiative principles that you'll hear tonight. We're a broad-based collaborative primarily of nonprofits, foundations, banks, and other public sector partners who are really working to make sure that the regional transit system provides the opportunity for everyone to have a high quality of life in our region. The Sustainable Communities Initiative has been a really important factor over the last three years for so many people across the region and so many organizations across the region to do the kind of planning that we should be doing all the time, working across jurisdictions, listening to stakeholders and engaging in community projects that really support and meet their needs, thinking about the best research that we bring to the table and really intentionally thinking 
before we get to an implementation stage about what will really build a set of vibrant communities all along our transit corridors. The principles that you're here tonight are also very common sense. They're the kinds of things that we think about when we think about good communities. Communities where everyone from a whole variety of income levels have the opportunity to live, places where there is economic vitality and opportunities to work, opportunities to think about a healthy built environment and healthy natural environment, um, and many, many other factors that really make our place great. Uh, we've so valued the leadership that Dr. Cog has shown in this collaborative space. The principles are very aspirational and we're very excited to work with you um, as well as the other partners throughout the region as we move into the implementation stage. So just ask you to listen to the issue briefing with interest. The Mile High Connects Steering Committee had the opportunity to hear a similar presentation last week. We unanimously approved um, and endorsed the principles um, and so we encourage you to, um, to also take them in and um, and look forward to working with you in the coming years. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. West. Hello, my name is Dick Taft. I'm president and CEO of Rocky Mountain Communities. We're a nonprofit affordable housing development company. Uh, we operate throughout the state of Colorado, but I'm here tonight to talk specifically about what we do here in Denver and the Denver metro region. Um, we, we own four properties in the uh, Denver metro area. In addition, we manage over 50 properties uh, throughout, or over 40 properties throughout the metro region. Um, I'm here to support uh, the, the, uh, so, uh, the issue of affordable housing throughout the Dr. Cog area. Uh, and that means housing that is for those who are extraordinarily poor, those who are uh, also workforce housing, senior housing, um, and um, that's really it. I'm sorry that the uh, the uh, the, the uh, s talk is so short. I was enlisted to do this about 45 minutes ago. So, <laughs> thank you. We appreciate brevity, but thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Taft. Okay, is there anyone else here this evening for public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to close the period for public comment. Oh, excuse me. I forgot. I forgot one of the most important public. So we have a comment over here. Um, it has come to my attention through Mayor Rakowski that um, Mayor Pro Tem Malay is celebrating a birthday. Oh. Not necessarily today. Don't and I promised today. we would all sing to it her. So today. please, that's please today. join me. Okay, that's why I'm Happy leaving at 9 o'clock. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jackie. Happy birthday to you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I will let Mayor Rakowski know. And all I want for my birthday is this tip approved. So work with me, people. <laughs> well, okay, maybe the, uh, the meeting may be over, too. I hear, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, moving on to our consent agenda. May I have a motion for... So moved. Is there a second? Thanks. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppo opposed? I love that. Abstained. We have our consent agenda approved. Moving on to our action agenda. Uh, that is item number 11. We're going to start with attachment D in your packet. Uh, Rich Morrow, our senior legislative analyst. Uh, bills on which positions have previously been taken. The, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I will try to move through this quickly. Um, and I'm actually going to kind of go in reverse order than uh, what I usually do. Before we get to what's in the packet, there were two bills that I wanted to talk to you about that actually haven't yet been introduced, but they might be. And you would not get a chance to consider them because our next meeting is after the session is over. So we wanted to bring them up. Uh, and luckily, uh, CDOT Director Bat already introduced the topic with the discussion of the Trans 2 uh, bonding proposal. Uh, I had been hearing that there could be a bill dropped Monday, but nothing has happened yet, so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Um, the other one, well, that one, um, I, I think part of bringing these up is to get direction from the board or to talk about the fact that you've got adopted policies and uh, uh, state policy statement that direct us in these kinds of instances when bills get introduced 
before we have a chance to actually present them to the board so the staff has some direction to act on them during the session. But we got a chance, uh, even though we can't present you with the bill, to at least talk to you about them and, and maybe get some feedback. So on that one, um, you know, our initial assessment of the idea uh, does piggyback on what Director Batt said, that it's not typically Dr. Cog supports proposals that will bring new money into the system and especially those that respect the planning process. And this seems to be coming from outside the planning process uh, and also could divert uh, funds from other projects that, that folks might want. So we would not recommend that the, the board support that if it does get introduced. Um, is there any comments on that one before I mention the other one? But or is there just clarification. So based on our existing policy, you have what you need to advocate on this on our behalf, yes. just if we do I nothing so. tonight. Okay, yes, great, thanks. So. Uh, the other one, oh, y yes, Chris. Just quickly, is that a, we would not be in support, support of, or yeah, we would, we would actually be in opposition to? Uh, I, I don't want know, to prolong the discussion, I'm just wondering what, oh, you don't? what we're giving you, you I mean, we're sort of giving you how, the nod to do you what? Want to be, yeah, unless you want to give me staff di discretion. Jennifer. Commissioner Rogier. And Thank you, Madam Chair. I, we can't take a position on a bill we haven't seen. We, we have no idea what it says. We, we don't even know if it's going to drop. How can we give position to staff to argue for or against on something we haven't even seen? Jennifer, did you want to uh, no. make a comment? No, that's okay. No, okay. Um, did you want to address the commissioner's well, comment? Yeah, I mean, since we don't have a bill, um, typically what staff would do is use the, the uh, policy statement that you adopted in January uh, as a guide to uh, act at the legislature in the board's interest and then report back at the next meeting. So if that's okay with you. Um, and has that been done in the past. Yes, that, there have been times in the past that has occurred. That's that's why we, we adopted the policy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the second bill is one that um, has been discussed is um, relates to the issue with Senate Bill 228 and the Tabor uh, refunds and how the potential for Tabor, re Tabor refunds uh, are going to either cut in half the 228 transfers to transportation or, or possibly even eliminate them completely. Um, there's been talk about uh, something called the hospital provider fee that was introduced in uh, legislation uh, about six or seven years ago as a way for the, st for the hospitals to se essentially assess themselves a fee that they would pay to the state and then the state could use that to match federal uh, or draw down federal Medicaid matching dollars, but somehow uh, that revenue that's coming into the state is being counted as part of the state's revenue limit under the Tabor uh, revenue cap, and so it's helping to drive this Tabor refunds, which are then driving down the Senate Bill 228 transfers. So there's talk about um, seeing if there's if it's legal to. Um, have that hospital provider fee process designated as essentially like an enterprise that would not be considered under the Tabor calculations, thereby lowering the state's revenue and allowing the 228 transfers uh, to, continue, to flow, possibly the full amount. Uh, so there is a definite increase in transportation funding connection to that one. Uh, it, again, may or may not be introduced, but uh, staff's in initial assessment is that we would have discretion to support that under the board's policy of supporting additional funding for transportation. But I wanted to present that to you tonight and see if there's any additional comments about that. Oh, Council Member Teal. Because that's, you're, you're asking for comments now. If you would like to, yes. Uh, so um, what is the source of those funds that are coming in, and, and, and tell me again the the name of the uh, the funds coming in. It's called hospital. the hospital provider fee. So hospitals in the state actually uh, pay a fee to the state of Colorado, and then the state is able to use that money 
to draw down federal Medicaid funds that then they turn around and use to uh, provide medical care to indigent p people, sorry, to indig indigent clients. And that also then re reduces the amount of money that hospitals are, are spending on uncompensated care. And the nature of the bill is to treat this, these funds as At an enterprise fund so that it is not counted in the, the, the general revenue of the state. Right, and it's not for Tabor purposes. Right, and so it would not be counted under the Tabor revenue limits. Right. Well, I, I wouldn't, and so uh, I guess I would encourage us all to oppose this, because the bottom line is, and it was something that um, um, you know Commissioner Rogier made a point about earlier in the evening in a different meeting. This is still the money of the people of Colorado. How is it okay, not? Okay, How is it wait, not? Excuse me. I am going to keep control of the meeting. Um, and if you are yielding the floor, I will call on the next person. Are you, are you concluding your comments? I would be happy to yield the floor to hear okay. the answer to that. Okay. Objection. Well, Count, Commissioner Jones, raise your hand. So I'm going to call on Commissioner Jones. And then I have a feeling Mr. Nevitt has a com councilor. <laughs> Well, I, I don't want to prolong the, the meeting tonight. I do think it's important for us to recognize that there will be new, no Senate Bill 2, or very few to no Senate Bill 228 funds for transportation. This is the money that's paying for I-70 East. Um, and so we should expect Dr. Cog to be asked to pay more money for that project if we don't manage to shake free some Senate build 228 funds. This is the only solution on the table right now and it's very consistent with the creation of enterprise funds that have happened at the state legislature before like with the Division of Wildlife. So I think it's within the spirit of managing um, revenues under Tabor um, but still allowing us to provide for critical transportation dollars that we desperately need. And I think that's a focus of Dr. Cog. We have policy about supporting that. So I feel like this is pretty consistent with where we've been in the past on legislati legislation. Councilmember Nevitt. Agree 100% with everything that uh, Elise Jones said. Just a question uh, for Rich. The, so the, this, uh, this money that the uh, hospitals sort of banded together, decided to subject themselves to, that sum of money, is, if, if it's then sort of recalculated as an enterprise fund, which is then used to pull down uh, Medicaid money, is that enough to do the trick? I think it's close, and I don't know if our lobbyists in the back <laughs> have better numbers than me on that, what the exact numbers are, but um, my understanding is it would be at least enough to ensure, uh, you know, half of the, or, you know, a certain part of the uh, funds, bec of the tr transfers right now, uh, there's, there's, there's a danger right? of, of no 228 transfers at all. Right. Okay, so it would at least, you're at least confident that it would get us half of the 220. That's my understanding, at least that much. Uh, Commissioner Partridge. Yeah, because the numbers fl fluctuate. You know, I think if we, if much of anybody's fault what's going on in the legislature, that, that the whole Tabor issue tell you, puts everything in a tailspin, and you can take all the reason you want. So I think it's probably going to get fleshed out. I think at least you say it very well. And regarding 228, you know, we had some promises made, but we all know when money's at the state legislature, it doesn't mean it's going to really come to you. It can get uh, moved all around. So I, I, I really believe we're probably at that point of saying it, it's going to occur at state legislature, whatever we do, because I think the, the uh, Tabor issue will confuse a lot of issues, no doubt, that we try to make reason with. So I am hearing general consensus for, uh, for allowing our, our um, lobbyists to adhere to the principles that we adopted as an organization for approving or supporting legislation down at the Capitol. Am I, and, I, and I understand. I like that, adopt, uh, adhere to adopted principles. Well, I mean, that is exactly what we're doing. So, but I recognize it's not, it's not, you know, 100% agreement, but I do, 
Unless I hear a strong objection, I'm going to, we're going with that, folks. Okay, so right. we're going with that. All right, thank you. Uh, and then I wanted to talk about new bills um, in the attachment. New bills is attachment E. F. Uh, Senate Bill 1302 on uh, assisted living facility administrator continuing education. Um, this is a, another case of, of a bill that uh, has gotten introduced and already acted on. A lot of activity happened on this before we got a chance to bring it to the board. Uh, so it's already been amended in committee to address uh, s some of our concerns, although staff really doesn't think that the bill is needed at all, but at least now as it's amended, uh, it's, it's not hurtful. Um, and uh, our, our uh, Dr. Cog's uh, supervisor of our long-term care ombudsman program, Shannon Gimbel, was really helpful to me in working with the uh, bill sponsors and some of the other stakeholders in addressing the issues around this and some other work that's already going on. So at this point, I'd like to change the staff recommendation just to monitor and to make so that we can just make sure the bill stays in a harmless uh, posture. This is so that's 1302. It's, it's in, it, that is in attachment E. Yeah. Okay, it's the one bill in attachment E. Okay, and so uh, the staff recommendation is to monitor. Do I have a motion? Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Okay, there, is, there was a mistake in the packet, yes. so now we're gonna, the last um, bill SB 15212 in attachment D. It's the very, very last bill. Um, this is a bill we have not taken a position on yet, and it was mis there was a misunderstanding, and it ended up in the wrong section. So we're now going to discuss that. So if you want to turn to the last page of attachment D, it's SB 15212, stormwater facilities, not injure water rights. Um, okay, good. And, yeah, and that was the one that was brought up and discussed here. And, and really, nothing, this is one where nothing has happened in the last month, basically. It's still sitting in committee. Um, I think that the, the, the sponsors and some of the other interested parties are still trying to work out uh, the details on that. And um, other than that, there's really nothing new that I have to uh, report on that bill. Um, I think it still has a possibility of moving forward. And, um, and, and I, if I recall right, I had heard a fair amount of support from most of the members last month. Um, so, so Rich, your position is to support this. Okay, so is there any, um, is there any discussion this evening on that? Uh, Council Member Roth. Just point out one item, and it, that is that the minutes do reflect the conversation correctly. Mm -hmm. It was just inadvertently put in the right. wrong depth. Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Correct. It, was just, it was just a mistake there. But, but uh, does anyone want, there's a uh, recommended position of support. Is there any discussion or is there a motion? A motion. Uh, Roger, come on. Rich, as, uh, as I understand, this bill will be heard on Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I understand there may be some amendments coming forward re regarding some issues out of the San Luis Valley. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, just that there are going to be amendments. I don't know the details, and, and I don't know if our lobbyists in the back know any more about the details of those amendments. They're shaking their head no. But, but we have heard that there's some amendments that have worked out that I think should allow the bill to move forward. And was it with that group out of the San Luis Valley? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think there was also the Eastern Plains, too, or Southeast. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank well. you. Uh, a move to support. Support. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to move back to the bills for which we've already taken a position. Right. And I'm only going to update you on our two top priority. Uh, aging bills, um, finally some good news. Uh, happy to report that both uh, House Bill 1100 and House Bill 1033 uh, passed third reading in the House of Representatives this morning on uh, pretty significant large uh, bipartisan votes and will be moving to the Senate next week. But they're going to be moving pretty quickly since still got a whole chamber to get through and there's only about two, a little more than two weeks left in the session. So um, in particular, uh, let me just say real quick on 1100, that's the bill that um, 
uh, allocates the $4 million increase in state funding for senior services, uh, $2 million out of general fund monies, and $2, $2 million as an, uh, a continuing appropriation to the Older Coloradans Fund. And so we're real pleased with, with that bill moving forward. Uh, the other one that we're working really hard is, uh, is House Bill 1033 and the Strategic Planning Group on Aging um, that uh, um, I'm happy that last Friday the House Appropriations Committee decided to uh, actually fund that committee with $365,000 uh, to get that uh, group off the ground. And um, that was, uh, I think, a pretty good accomplishment given that uh, the committee had about $5 million to divide up between dozens and dozens of bills. And so they gave us a, a good chunk of that for, for that group for, or for that planning group. Um, the bill has not been introduced yet, obviously, in the Senate, so we don't know what committee it's going to be assigned to. Uh, but I wanted to put you all on notice that I'm probably going to be um, contacting you about having you contact your state senators uh, to uh, support that bill. Um, again, we, we like to make the uh, aging issues have always been uh, nonpartisan and bipartisan issues, and um, we think that this uh, planning group is a really important long-term effort in addition to complementing the, the short-term funding efforts that we uh, pursue. And so it's really important at this time to make sure that this gets through in these crazy last two weeks of the session. Okay, Rich, are there any other changes to anything else for us? Uh, nothing significant, okay. really, other than what's noted there. Some of them have Perfect. moved on to a few committees, but are you know, other in okay. the process. Are but. there any questions from board members on any of these? Nope. Okay, wonderful. We're going to move Thank on you. then. Thank you, Rich. Oh, oh excuse George me. Biden. Excuse me. Who did I miss? Council member. Oh, uh, no. Mayor, Mayor Atchison. Thank you. Uh, as the report shows, uh, this is the one that many of us in our communities are, are continuing to watch and like a bird dog. So it got out of the Senate, and that's SB 177. Oh, yeah. yeah. Construction defects. Uh, it's over to the House. Folks, it needs a lot of calls. It's, it is DOA on the House at this point if we don't get it fixed. So if you've got any reference to anyone at the House side, kind of prop them up, encourage them. Uh, otherwise, this thing is going to kill us with uh, condominium projects region-wide. Again, we will not have a resolution. A number of municipalities are watching this. The minute it fails in the House and doesn't get done in legislature, we're going to see a flood of ordinances coming in for every municipality or county to fix the problem. And we're going to have 52 different versions of it. <laughs> So but Lone Trees is the best. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ours no, is up, ours no, is up I, for I, first I do actually reading. not want to minimize the comments by Mayor Atchison. I think they're on point. Rich, yes. You might mention the fact that you included small deal 234 with money for the seniors. Yeah, that, um, they want me to make it clear that tied to that House Bill 1100, the $4 million I was talking to, um, it was really important that with the help of our lobbyists and other coalition of folks that we first got four million dollars set aside in the long bill before it was ever introduced so we didn't have to fight others for that money so that that four million dollars would have never gotten even uh, half of that if we had had to do it after the fact so it was a big deal to get it in the long bill and I think we should thank our lobbyists for their tremendous efforts down there to get that done so thank you Okay, um, we are going to move on now to uh, action agenda uh, item number 12, move to adopt the 2016-21 TIP. I think we are all very familiar with it. The information is in our packet. Todd is here to answer any questions of the board. If there's anyone that has any questions, yes. I don't have questions. I'd like to move approval. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's much cheaper than what my family got me. Um, actually, it's not. So uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, oh, no. I'm Mr. Pfeiffer would like to continue I the discussion recap. for at least two or three hours. Oh, thank you, Mr. Pfeiffer. <laughs> Evidently, your camera crew left, yeah. funny man. <laughs> he turned the mic off and everything. Uh-huh. Okay. So in, uh, in all seriousness, this is an important item. So um, I, I, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I don't see anyone looking to have discussion. All those in favor, please. Aye. 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 Do you need a count? 
Okay, please, oppo anyone opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, abstained? All right, thank you. The motion passes. Woohoo, we have a two. Round of applause. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Okay, we have two informational briefings. In the interest of time, I have asked Jennifer to, um, to we're going to switch and have the presentation on sustainable communities, regional principles happen next. Is, uh, is that uh, acceptable to the board and the discussion on our plan, program, adoption, voting information? I've asked Jennifer to hold on. If we can get to it tonight, great. If not, or, or is the group okay with postponing it, that discussion? I think it was a very thorough explanation in our packet, right? So I think we're all okay with that. Perfect. Okay, with that, Mr. Jim Taylor, please come forward and uh, introduce the, the uh, PowerPoint Richard did something. Thank discussion. You. Stretch, Jim, stretch while Thank they uh, get the technical difficulties worked out. Okay. Well, good evening, board. My name is Jim Taylor, and uh, for those of you who don't me, know me, I was elected to the Littleton City Council in 2001 and became alternate to Dr. Cog, and I've been involved in this organization ever since that time in one capacity or another. Jim is on the TAC. You need to completely vet yourself here. Yeah, I'm on the TAC, <laughs> Advisory Committee on Aging and SCI Committee. So anyway, I want to give a very brief history of how we got to this point here, where we are tonight. The first time we made a grant application, we were turned down. And we were turned down because there was no collaboration in the grant application, no outside group input or consideration, no overall community vision. Those are some of the reasons that were, were given. But in our second application, we reached out to a diverse group of organizations seeking representatives to serve on the executive committee and guide us. One of the stated purposes of the executive committee was to report the project outcomes and recommendations to the Dr. Cog board, which is why we are here tonight. The membership of the executive committee brought together leaders from all sectors. They were very generous in giving their time to the project and ensuring that its outcomes met both the goals of the grant and the needs of the region. I want to point out that there was a standing invitation to all the members of the Dr. Cog board to attend and participate in these meetings of the executive committee. One member of the Dr. Cog board did just that and take us up on that offer and attended the executive core group meetings that were held, and that is Mayor Joyce Jay from Wheat Ridge. Daisy West, who is the director of Mile High Connects, was also a loyal attendee of the executive core meetings and should be recognized for going that extra mile as well. In addition to the executive committee, we solicited more than 90 organizations, cities, counties, nonprofits, foundations, associations, businesses, public health agencies, housing authorities, etc., to form a consortium that met on topics related to the grant. A coordinating committee was created to make sure that the work stayed on track. The coordinating committee was composed of such groups as Reconnecting America, Place Matters, Enterprise Community Partners, Mile High Connects, Fresk, and representation from the executive committee. The SCI grant has allowed a big leap forward in metro collaboration and cooperation. In today's world, you cannot work alone to address the solve or solve problems as they tend to spill beyond the small context that each of us represents. The executive committee recognized that there needed to be a coordination between public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Hopefully, we have helped to bridge that gap. We went through a very deliberative process to pick sites for the catalytic projects which can be adopted or replicated in other communities. The East, Gold, and Northwest Corridor catalytic projects and technical assistance studies identified specific sites. The West Line had previously been identified. Through a competitive process, firms were selected to help with plans to jumpstart the possibilities for each site for providing market readiness studies. The sites selected were Westminster Station on the Northwest Line, Arvada Ridge, Wheat Ridge, Ward Road Station on the Gold Line, and the Peoria Smith Road Station on the East Line to DIA. Working groups and stakeholder committees had input into final recommendations coming from the corridors. RTD and your staffs were involved in all these steps. Rounding out the work was a regional equity atlas, incorporation of some of the boomer bond concepts, and the outcomes assessment and knowledge sharing, also known as OAK, study. Currently, briefings are occurring before city councils and county commissioners, the RTD board, and to you tonight with our final recommendations. 
Great thanks go to the members of the Executive Committee, the core group, the Coordinating Committee for their wisdom, guidance, expertise, and bearing with us for the past three plus years. The staff, Dr. Cog, that was put together to lead us through this process has been invaluable. And I especially want to thank Paul Aldready for the leadership and great writing skills he has. And now I'm going to turn it over to Paul to finish the rest of the, our report and our final recommendations. Thank you, Jim. So much for my technical expertise. <laughs> I am pressed yet again. Um, I think that we all owe a huge debt of gratitude for Jim Taylor for leading the executive committee and being the voice of SCI over the last three years. <laughs> you know, before I dive into this, I, I want to say that sometimes those of us who have been working on these issues kind of get so far in the weeds we don't see the reality. Um, this weekend I was riding my bike, actually the first time I was riding my bike after the consortium meeting this time, so I didn't get hit, um, along the west line and uh, I suddenly realized what this was all about when I saw families walking down the, uh, the path, when I saw cyclists, when I saw people waiting at every station, when I saw people playing frisbee golf in Lakewood Gulch that this was not about just building transit, this was about building communities. And uh, it, it really brought me back to why we do this work. Um, so I'm gonna really quickly do background, because you guys have seen this many times. I wanted to put this up here to remind you that our goal was to take a look at how we leverage the build out of this transit system that we're spending so much time and money on, this once in a lifetime opportunity to really meet multiple goals for the region and for the individual communities. Um, as you recall, there were five primary tasks in SCI, regional planning, corridor implementation, the catalytic projects, stakeholder engagement, actually reaching out to stakeholders in a more robust fashion than we've ever done in the past, and the outcomes assessment and knowledge sharing. We've been over all of these at various times in the last few months. Um, so um, let's get right into the outcomes. So in terms of the regional planning piece of this, we, we do, developed a regional housing strategy that helped inform the, uh, the thinking that the board um, housing ad hoc group brought to the MVIC and uh, MetroVision processes. Uh, we came up, we developed a regional economic strategy that uh, fulfilled the same function from the economic side. We took the uh, regional equity atlas and made it into a usable website um, with uh, a partnership with Mile High Connects and the Piton Foundation. I know many of you have seen and used the Regional Equity Atlas. I have the hit number to prove it. Um, and then finally, we put uh, some of the funding into the Boomer Bond Project, uh, specifically doing community outreach and developing the online toolkit. Uh, the corridor planning, I went over this a couple of months with you. We came up with the blueprints in each corridor. Um, so far, I have made presentations in uh, Arvada, Westminster, Superior, just this, uh, I guess, a week ago, Monday. Um, I'll be doing this in Broomfield on the 28th. We're working with Adams County to do a date for the presentation. Adams County gets a little tricky because they were in all three corridors. So uh, I don't think anybody wants to hear all three corridor presentations one evening. So we're figuring out how to do that. The other piece is that um, we have some funding left that we're going to put in to support the uh, corridor planning process in the North Metro area. So we're working out what that looks like. So we want to have that in place before our presentation in Adams County. Uh, we did technical assistance projects in all three corridors. Um, I think uh, it becomes really interesting when you look at these, you really see the priorities of the corridor working groups, which as Jim said, consisted primarily of uh, representatives from your municipal staffs. 
what they picked really demonstrates, I think, what the, the needs and the priorities are in the corridors to market readiness studies, looking at job creation and the attraction of businesses that not only bring jobs but needed amenities into the corridors, the affordable housing, preservation and creation. And finally, this bike and pedestrian accessibility study in the Northwest Corridor that not only looked at issues around bicycle and pedestrian access and the transit stations themselves, but specifically also looked at the first and final mile connections. Um, and the catalytic projects, again, um, a, a, a very strong indication of needs and, and really, I think, some surprising results. I think often we think of housing and especially affordable housing as an afterthought when we think of these things. But what we saw in at least three of these corridors with Peoria Station and the Westminster Station and the Sheridan Station sites is that affordable housing and mixed uh, rate housing can actually catalyze developments in these communities. It can drive the, the critical mass of people you need to attract the services and retail businesses that are needed in these areas. So I think that that was, um, if not surprising to some people, um, a real wake-up call to many of us. Um, also, the, the need to spend some real time in looking at proactively and holistically at development in the areas. And I won't go into, I think I talked about this a couple of months ago in the corridor blueprints, but I think it's an, I think it's an obvious lesson in how we approach all of these transit stations and station areas. Um, you know, and I said at the beginning that we did a very robust stakeholder engagement process. And last year when I came to you about this exact same time, I went through all of that and talked about that. And you know, since that deserves a whole presentation on its own, I just want to talk a little bit about what the outcomes. And I think that this is tough is really especially critical because this is not advocates who are telling us these things. These are the people who live and work in your communities. Um, the need for reduced fares or fare options to help offset that combined housing transportation cost so that the people who actually need to use transit can use it. Um, the need for better community engagement and information in all of our planning processes, but certainly as these rail corridors get built and as we start the development process. This need of first and final mile connections that are robust and invite people to transit to use them. Um, the need for affordable housing options, the need for service and amenities in these station areas. And I think I've mentioned before, you know, if people have to take their children to daycare and they have to go two miles out of their way before they come back to rail, what is the likelihood of them using that rail is going to decrease. And it also decreases if your child gets sick during the day and you have to leave work and you're dependent on rail and then trying to make that connection to that place, that's just another needle uh, you know, it's just another nail in the coffin so of why you would not use it. So this becomes a really critical factor. And finally, this idea of cre creation of jobs and the job training that goes into supporting those jobs. Um, I think one of the things that's get really interesting in, when you look at the corridors in the metro area is the availability of education through community colleges and other educational institutions and in all of those and how that can be these corridors can be used to connect the job training with the actual jobs. Um, last month you got the full-blown um, uh, recommendations from the UCD in their outcomes assessment and knowledge sharing presentation. So I'm not going to go through all 19 of these. I just want to lay out a couple of them uh, and underscore them that have come up again and again, whether they're part of the corridor planning process or they're part of the stakeholder engagement process. So this need for additional collaboration in the future that we're all in this together. So it's not just the community or a community or a, the communities in the corridor. It's all the communities in the metro area that stand to benefit from this. And so we all need to be collaborating in this moving forward as well, not only among the communities, but upon, among the important stakeholders. This idea of holistic strategic planning and the station areas as whole communities. Um, I'm trying to get through these without reading all of them. This idea of prioritizing first and final mile con connections. Um, looking at changing demographics and developing a regional approach to housing. Again, with the regional approach to housing, this, it's not as if you know, every, every, every community is going to have uh, a certain amount of housing. This isn't about doling it out. What this is about is where do you put the housing where it's most needed to help the entire region. 
um, looking at the fair structure, and I, I commend RTD for going through their fair study right now, and, and I also commend all of the stakeholders in the community who are going through that process with them. So that brings us to the regional principles, because as Jim said, what the executive committee did is it take, took all of those outcomes, and, and just in what I gave you as, as uh, a background just now, you can just imagine the amount of information that everybody had to go through to say, okay, given that, what, do, what did we learn and how do we carry that forward? And so as the executive committee looked at all of that um, and, and realized that they had this obligation under the grant to report back to the Dr. Cog board, uh, what they looked at is what are those issues that cut across all of the, uh, the different tasks? And in doing so, how does that drive what we do moving forward? So first of all, what are the regional principles and recommended strategies? As I say, they're a reflection of all of the outcomes from all of the activities in SCI, whether that be regional planning or corridor planning or catalytic projects, stakeholder engagement, OAKS. Um, they are a set of principles to serve as a common foundation for future work to meet shared goals through collaboration. Um, and a lot of this information, uh, I, would, I would really encourage you to look in the packet at the regional principles piece that's the attachment, um, and especially critical because as I discovered earlier this evening, there's a previous copy of this floating around. Please look at the one in the packet because there is additional wording that clarifies um, this, this question about what the intention of these are. And finally, they are meant to be guidance for juris individual jurisdictions, agencies, and organizations in identifying kind of what they need or what they can do to move forward. Which begs the question, what are they not? Uh, they are not exhaustive and flexible in an unchanging list of possible policies and actions. This, this, this context in which we're operating right now, especially in, in regards to transit is very dynamic, it's changing. You know, we, we did a study on affordable housing in the Gold Corridor and that study was completed in December and three months later the numbers had already changed for the worse. So, you know, we have to remind ourselves that this, this stuff isn't cast in stone. And then the second piece is really critical and I, I'm not going to go into this too deeply because I think Jennifer's discussion earlier about the role of um, Dr. Cog really covered a lot of this, but it is not meant as a mandate. I was joking with somebody earlier today and I said, you know, I may have the demeanor of Moses, but I don't have the authority and so the principles are not like the Ten Commandments. What they are is guidance. They are to inform what we do moving forward and to give us some ideas. So the principles are where, how we come together and the recommended strategies provide some guidance for communities or organizations that decide they want to do this, these, this is the guidance in helping take them to that place. So what are they? The five princi first principle is housing opportunity. Uh, again, I won't, I won't read the principle, it's pretty self-explanatory. Under every one of these principles, there are a set of recommended strategies, again, to be used as guidance as ch communities choose to take action. And what you will see as we go through these next few slides on the uh, regional principles is that several topics in these recommendations cut across all these recommendations. This idea of coming up with targets, so you have measurable, verifiable targets against which to see how you're progressing that help you identify the need. That's very common in all of these. The need to look at location and is, is, very, is very different in all, it, it cut, location cuts across all of these but in different ways. So in the, one, in the housing opportunity uh, principle, where do we actually put this housing? In the economic principle, where do we put the jobs? And finally this idea of providing incentives to jurisdictions who choose to make this happen. You know, what those incentives might look like. How do we be creative in how we think about financing? So this is a uh, housing opportunity. There are six recommended strategies under this principle. The second one is healthy places. The need as we grow and as we think about transit-oriented development and regional growth overall, how do we think about incorporating public health and environmental quality and, and a quality about the built environment into all of this? 
So under this principle, there are four uh, recommended strategies. Again, targets, best practices, coordination, that big one that cuts across all of these, and the incentives to jurisdictions. The third principle is about economic vitality and resiliency, which really looks at the power of taking action, especially in the, in the area of job growth, and using it for the economic benefit of the entire region as well as the communities in which that occurs. Uh, six recommended strategies under this principle. Transit accessibility is the fifth principle. Uh, this one's a little different uh, in that it specifically applies to how people are using transit and how do we make it more accessible. Um, the first uh, recommended strategy is really this first and final mile piece. Uh, the second is looking at how do you reduce transit costs, especially to vulnerable populations, those being low-income folks, seniors, and other people who are very dependent on transit. Um, and then finally, uh, how, do, how does transit and how provide access to jobs, housing, and other needed services, and how do we improve that? And then the final principle, transit-oriented communities, is really the one in which we captured all of those things that cut across all of these areas and brought them into sync in the way that we look at transit-oriented communities. Uh, so you see collaboration, stakeholder engagement, incentives, bringing the tools and resources needed to support planning and development. And finally, uh, doing some coordinated infrastructure planning to reduce uh, impacts. And that's it. So again, I want to emphasize that uh, these principles are there to guide the choices that communities make and to provide them with the information they need as they choose to go into this in more depth to help them along the way. And uh, before I take any questions, I will also say thanks to all of you. Uh, and I appreciate all the support that you've given over the last two and a half years. Uh, I thank the Dr. Cog staff and all of our partners. And I defer to you, Madam Chairman. OK, thank you. Do we have, does that, blah, I can't even speak at this point. Elise Jones. <laughs> um, not so much a question, but more a comment. I, I wanted to thank you, Paul, and you, Jim, and, and the many folks that came and spoke to us during public comment uh, for this incredible effort. Um, a number of us were at the SCI celebration. Was it last week where we got to hear, hear some very entertaining words from Sue Horn? That uh, great metaphor with the baseball season there. Um, but it just embodied to, to have that outpouring of um, enthusiasm about what took place through SCI and to hear folks from HUD and from other regions really congratulate the Denver Metro region on the incredible effort that went into this and, and the great accomplishments. It was just very gratifying to, to be a part of Dr. Cog and be a part of that. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And if you did participate in the SCI work, could you please, and I know I, some of you may have left, but if you are here, would you please, th those of you that are here, will you please stand up and let the board acknowledge you guys too? Jim, can you please encourage your fellow partners there? Thank you very much. Do we have, uh, Mayor Cernanek, I knew it. I was just waiting. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Paul and all the partners and Jim uh, as well and it was uh, it, it was very interesting uh, and exciting to be there last week a um, couple of, of questions that sound like they're kind of rain but they're actually practical because one of the things that happened last week uh, for those that weren't there is to hear from other communities that have gone through the similar exercises and what steps they've taken next um, and my comment is at least based on some of my discussions um, one of the uh, beauties and challenges of Dr. Cog is our voluntary aspects. And as Paul, in your comment, you certainly mentioned them as guides. Uh, it seems that the other communities actually have some leverage uh, around moving things forward. So my questions are, are along the lines of being practical. For example, um, the principles and uh, something that's important is affordable fare structure. Um, how is that being considered within RTD? And it's not necessarily a question for you, um, but that, that question of how does that, that fit? I don't know if other 
uh, city councils or counties have had testimony come before them, but certainly we have heard uh, from some folks about uh, concern over the current proposals. So uh, that's one item. Uh, second is um, with regard uh, your comments around where jobs and where housing and uh, in the context of doing it in the best way for the region. Um, a lot of our land use decisions, uh, if not most of our land use decisions are local. Uh, they, they, they tend to be backyard uh, kind of issues that we don't bring before this board uh, or in any other context on that broad basis. Um, and the question that I have is, um, given those, uh, how does that happen uh, so that there is uh, the possibility of, of best leveraging and being most effective and efficient, uh, if at all, given our voluntary and guide aspects that, that we have. Uh, because I would have no, no idea how to take that into my community to say, okay, yeah, we have a couple of transit stations and we have some buses. Um, what does that mean for us? Particularly when you start talking about targets and measuring for success, um, you're not allocating those out, but yet how does that happen down at the local community level where some of those land use decisions are being made? And, and I'll leave it at that. But, but mine is that, that taking that next step from the principles and, and how to make them practical uh, in the sense, in, in our spirit of voluntary and recognizing these are guidelines. Well, I think that that's exactly right, Mayor. I think that the, I think the voluntary nature of that is, is critical. And so this is, not, this is not something that the Dr. Cog Board or any other entity is going to tell communities what to do. I think where this has to occur, I, I would answer your question in pointing out the model that we used in the existing in the corridors that are now under construction where the communities came together and did this planning among themselves. I think that that's the model that has to happen that, that the that whether it's within the context of Dr. Cog or in other contexts, communities are going to have together and have, a, have to have this discussion about where, where the right place is or where the most appropriate place maybe instead of the right place is for this type of growth to occur. Um, you know, I, I'm mindful, and I, I don't have the slide with me tonight, but I'm mindful that uh, I have a slide from the West Corridor before they incorporated into the West Line Corridor Collaborative that when Lakewood and Denver each came up with their list of growth, uh, whether that be housing or jobs or retail space that was going to occur at individual stations, they came up with numbers that were so large not even the whole Denver region could possibly absorb that. And it, that forced them to think, okay, given that we're not going to create a million square feet of, of retail in the West Corridor, where is that most appropriate? So those two cities got together, at least on that line, and, and started thinking about, in those station areas, where did that most appropriately occur? So if you think about this regionally, it's going to be all of the communities getting together within some context, and again, whether that's Dr. Cog or something else, moving into the future, that will be up to you to decide. But that sp spirit of collaboration is what's going to drive this. In terms of the uh, fair, that's a dis discussion. I know that that's a huge issue um, and one better taken up with RTD directly. But again, I think that the critical thing there is, this is not just RTD's issue. And, and so, as with my previous comment, how we address the fares and the fair studies. RTD can come up with every study in the world, but it's going to require a partnership or a collaboration among communities, organizations, and RTD to come to some kind of workable solution. I hope that was responsive. Mayor Atchison. I want to go back to Mayor Sernanik's comment about the fair. This is, this is an ongoing discussion that's in the public today not only on the fare structure but on the service plan. Mm -hmm. uh, at least within Westminster there have been two public meetings, one for each of those subjects. Our council has gone and testified at those hearings. We have put it out to the public. The US 36 uh, coalition has taken a stand, has provided comments. The NATO group has also provided that. So really it's up to us as organizations to get that feedback and I'm sure if there's anybody has missed the opportunity to provide comments, Bill Van Meter will personally stand up and take those comments in Not a closed-door room. Not now. But 
to your point, it's, it's us as communities getting involved and get the information back to those who are proposing the ideas of the fair structure and the service plan. And if you don't agree with them, you need to tell them. But also, if you agree with them, give them a couple of an agreements in there once in a while. It can't all be bad. But I think it's up to us uh, as the leaders of our community, our elected officials, get our citizens involved, make them aware of that. We've been putting out the website, so if people can't get to the public meetings, here's the website you can go put comments on for both of those because they are being run almost concurrent, but they are separate meetings. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Is everyone ready to go celebrate my birthday at their own houses? <laughs> uh, All right. Jackie, Jackie, can I, can I, yes. uh, I, I really want to um, thank Jim Taylor, who, I don't know if Jim's still here. He is. Yeah. Who, who went out of his way to invite me to uh, attend uh, some of the, the meetings, especially the executive meetings, and it was a, it was a great experience. I, I really got to hear some uh, wonderful comments. We had some real experts in all of these areas. We were really fortunate to have the kind of volunteers that, that created this plan, as well as Paul's fabulous work. And, um, and for my own city, I know that I, that I plan to, to bring this information to them because it's what it, what it comes down to, it's really quality of life. All of these principles are quality of life. And I think every city is, is trying to find that in their, own, in their own city. And this gives us some principles as to how to reach that. So I'm pretty excited about it. Thank you. And I think we all owe Jim Taylor uh, credit for a lot of different things, uh, it, not just SCI, but the great work he did at this table and continues to do on the tax. So again, thank you to everyone who participated in the SCA process for the great work, and we will hear more soon. So with that, we are adjourned. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Do, you guys can stay and do the committee reports. I, I'm leaving. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're out. We're out of here. Oh, just unless there's. I mean, we did have rack, but it's my. It's my, oh well. That's right. Now we got. And now we got Jack. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. God darn it. All right. Bob. Oh, yep. Bob. Hey, I know. Hey, Bob. If they're still awake. I'm so sorry. I know. I was a bummer. All right. Okay. I'm taking my See ya.